Session. Right. Can anybody? Can everybody still hear us? Raise your finger. Good. Excellent. <laughs> Something's all right. Okay. I advise members to welcome to use Wi-Fi connected mobile devices, and as long as they're airplane mode and all devices are muted. Gemma and Philip are sort of joining us remotely. Uh, assembly broadcasting will keep all members in the spotlight for all agenda items, as we hope. Uh, members, are we content to proceed through the agenda? Uh, the first item I would wish to raise is I would like, on behalf of the committee, to express our condolences to Melissa McHugh, a member of our committee, on the uh, death of his mother. And I would like to formally, on behalf of this committee, to write to Melissa and his family and, wish, and give him all our condolences and give him all our best wishes and thoughts and prayers uh, as we go forward, if we were content to do that. Are we so agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, obviously, there's been no apologies have, have been received, but our Philip or Gemma, I, I, I would assume that uh, Melissa is not going to be with us. But have any of you been given um, approval for uh, his vote? They stopped. Yeah, uh, yes, sorry. Uh, I, I, Melissa has asked me to pass on his apologies, and Gemma uh, will vote on his behalf should the need arise. Okay, so noted. He didn't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame him. Uh, move on to any declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest? Uh, draft minutes of proceedings. Uh, inform members of draft meetings of the minute on the 30th of January or page 6. Uh, Peter advises me there is a typ typographical error. It should be Lindsay, as in L I S N E Y, chartered surveyors rather than Lindsay. Are we content to amend this in the draft minutes? Okay. Are we content for the minutes to be published on the website? Okay. Yep. Uh, we move on to matters arising. There are no matters arising. Right, now let's really press the system now. Uh, can I invite Joanne and Jeff to come on on Starleaf, please? Can the officials add them to Spotlight? Yes. Got it. Okay. Joanne, Jeff, how are you? Can you hear us? Yes, we can, Chair. Excellent. Yes, indeed. Excellent. That is an improvement of what, whatever has happened today as well. Just want to remind members that the session has been recorded and answered. Form members are revised clerk's brief is in the tabled items. A copy of the Minister's budget statement and the related consultation document is also in the tabled items, and we heard from the Minister uh, the other day. And a response to committee queries is tabled on items uh, on, I think it's page 97 in the tabled papers. Uh, team, uh, I don't know who's going to lead, Joanne or Jeff. Would you like to come out with your, uh, make your opening statements, please? Joanne, I think you may be on mute. Sorry, I am. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm going to lead, and uh, Jeff will jump in as necessary, particularly on the on the on the figure side of things. I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee on the draft budget 21-22. As you be aware, the executive cannot set its budget without a funding envelope being set by HM Treasury in the spending review. The spending review outcome is unfortunately not announced until the 25th of November and it only provides for a single year budget. Excluding the funding provided for COVID, the spending of the outcome provided a broadly flat cash position for normal departmental spending. Once one-off funding for public services provided in 2021 was, had been factored in. In terms of percentage changes um, from 2021... Joanne just, to, Joanne, just because we know each other fairly well now, so I hope you don't mind as we interject as we go through, just to keep the thing flowing. But, uh, the, but the minister was saying it was a flat cash budget, but there were already uplifts in the budget that, from last year that have that have come through. So we're not dealing with a flat cash situation, are we? We're moving forward. We, we really are dealing with a near enough flat cash situation. What happened was in 2021 we received one-off funding from the NDNA agreement, which was used to meet sort of ongoing departmental pressures. Because the funding was only there for the one year, that was removed in 21-22, which means that that offset any increases we got in the spend review. So in effect, on resource DEL, our core DEL funding, excluding COVID and any sort of financial packages, only had a very slight increase of 0.3%. I think it's about 50 million above the position the previous year. So it really is for resource DEL flat cash. There was a 6.5% increase in conventional capital funding between the years 
and a 6.2% decrease in financial transactions capital. Okay, thanks. Okay, so just then to give a little bit more background in the budget. So the, on the resource budget side, as I said, the outcome reflects effectively flat line our 2021 budget position. Um, and that, that is for departments as well as the overall block position. So with increased demands on public services and taking account of inflation, it's going to be a challenge, challenge to deliver existing services at their current levels, something that the Minister referred to in a statement. However, the Executive has chosen to raise the regional rate for both domestic and non-domestic customers in light of the impact of COVID-19 on both households and businesses. Um, you may have noticed in the statement, the Assembly the Minister also called on councils to consider taking the same approach when setting their district rate. Of course, we have no control over how councils set that district rate. With little additional funding that's available, the Executive prioritised allocations to provide key funding to continue welfare mitigations, provide for agenda for change pay and special education needs. In terms of the capital budget, the draft budget sets out some 1.75 billion of capital spending and will help to deliver an executive's flagship projects, including the A5, the A6, as well as the new mother and children's hospital. The capital allocations will enable investment in our infrastructure while supporting the construction sector. Just to go back to the, Turning to, sorry, just to go back yep. to the uh, mother and children's uh, bill, but that bill's already started, so a lot of that's already been profiled. So how much of that is additional profiling, or is that just a continuation of the profiling from the previous budget? It would be a continuation of, of the numbers that were in the previous budget. So really, it's just continuing that project and ensuring it can be completed. And, the, and that is due also to the cost overruns and the overruns that have been in the project? Well, Jeff may have more details on the actual figures underpinning it, but we would, you know, capital projects run over a number of years and we would expect to put funding in for those flagships over that period. So it is that normal profile. There may be something in that if the costs have increased. I don't actually just have the figures with me on that. Yeah, and that's the A5 bit is our contribution, but doesn't include the contribution from the, uh, the Republic of Ireland, any of their um, 75 million or so that they have, have pledged over the last sort of decade, which we haven't seen any of yet. Jeff will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have factored in some of their contribution, but what we're reflecting is, is the net position here. So it, it is net of that, any contribution from the Republic. Okay. Thanks. Yes, that's correct. Okay, Chair, um, I continue then just a bit on, on the COVID funding. So that sort of reflected our, our normal day-to-day -day resource and, and capital bail position. Turning to COVID spending re review provided 538.2 million of resource funding for COVID support in 21-22 and a small amount of capital. This compares to the 3 billion we've got in the current financial year. The executive, in its draft budget, the executive allocated 380 million of this to health, 30.6 million to part for education to support families and low incomes through holiday hunger payments, and 0.7 million to part for economy for higher education places following the uncertainty that surrounded the A-level results earlier in the summer. This leaves 126.9 million available for further consideration as part of the final budget. And I, I think it's important to say that that's held forward, held back for the final budget, so as we can consider how things are developing in terms of COVID. Another important point in relation to the budget was the financial packages, um, which the executive has in place. And due to the legislative constraints, you'll be aware the executive's budget is restricted to the amount set out by the Secretary of State and notified to the Assembly by the Finance Minister's written ministerial statement on the, on the 1st of December. In his letter, the Secretary of State did not confirm a number of previously agreed financial packages, and therefore these cannot be factored into the, part of the, into the draft budget. This includes confidence in supply funding and new decade and new approach funding. We fully anticipate this funding will be provided in due course, and we hope that that will be prior to the final budget. So just the confidence and, in supply money. Was part of that part of that confidence in supply money was supposed to be out for um, the broadband project, wasn't it? And that has already been has that already been allocated? But we haven't. Got it that has, yeah. Yes, we haven't. We haven't got it formally confirmed, so we couldn't put it in our, our draft budget. But we fully expect that the money will be provided. It's it's you know a matter of timing rather than the money not being there. So those departments which were to receive funding from those packages are aware that that funding is anticipated and hopefully will be provided, if not in time for the final budget, then early in the new financial year. So we're expecting that. So expecting that figure will be it. Mean, the budget you're bringing, the draft budget you're bringing before us now, but you're expecting that the confidence and supply money will be in that 
plus the additionals you're expecting for sort of the COVID package as well? We're, we're hoping so. We're hoping it is um, on the confidence supply in the NDNA. It is dependent upon the Secretary of State writing again to the Finance Minister to confirm that funding is available. The Finance Minister would then need, another, need to make another statement to the Assembly to confirm that. So we're hoping that it will be done in time to allow it to be factored into the final budget. But if not, um, it should be hopefully be available early in the new financial year. We're certainly advising departments to, to plan on the basis that that money, money will be in place. Okay. Yep. Okay. And, and just finally, just, just uh, in terms of consultation, as you know, we want to go out and consult on the draft budget. Um, unfortunately, the period is not as long as we would have hoped for, but we have launched the consultation um, uh, with replies due to the 25th of February. Details of how to respond to that are available in the budget document on the Department of Finance website. And of course, we're hoping that the committee will fulfil its usual role in terms of consulting with the other committees. Okay. And that, that's really all I have to say, uh, Chair, but happy to take any questions. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Look, we've we've all got a, a large number of questions and we'll sort of we'll chip in as we as we go through, as you can imagine. Look, I'm going to take a couple of ones off the top, and then we'll sort of work our way down through as we get going. Um, the first question I have is, we've already heard the Department of Economy saying it's going to uh, somehow reprofile its £95 million for the voucher scheme into next year. And we've asked the Minister on several occasions, uh, what is the mechanism for doing this? And has the Treasury approved this? And can you give us some details about how monies that are supposed to be spent by the end of this financial year are now being moved into next financial year, and what is the mechanism for doing that? And if there's a mechanism for doing that, what is the mechanism, therefore, for the rest of the underspend? And there will obviously be questions, no doubt, from the rest of the committee about what is the, the last monitoring round of the degree of underspend there's likely to be. But could you just explain to us what that mechanism is? And just for clarity, I've been in discussion with the chairperson of the Economy Committee, and she is as blindsided as I am in the mechanism and how this is going to happen. Okay, Chair. Um, hopefully, well, I can try and explain the process as whether that provides clarity or not. Um, as you will know, um, there is limited scope under the normal arrangements for us to carry forward funding from one financial year into the other. That is provided under the Budget Exchange Scheme and is lifted, limited to a percentage of our final resource and capital Dale. Um, I think off the top of my head, um, we're able to carry forward this year, it would be about 85 million. Obviously, that's not enough for the proposals that are in place. So the Minister, our Minister has written, along with the devolved finance ministers in Scotland and Wales, to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, seeking further flexibility to carry forward further COVID funding. We're awaiting a response on that, but would hope that that would, that would be provided shortly. In the interim, we have been also discussing at official level with Treasury, and the indications that we have received from them is that they would look quite favourably upon request to carry for, forward funding we have received very late in the year. So we that's are hoping the, that that would... The, that's the 200 million just before, just after Christmas, or that period? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and if there's anything else comes out between now and the end of the financial year. So I say we're getting very positive um, feedback from Treasury on that. But again, we're waiting for that to be formally confirmed. Okay. But obviously, if that was the case, the 200 million would, would be enough to sort of honour those commitments that we've already made. But we go for further flexibility. Right. Once we get a. Yeah. But obviously, one of the issues that's been raised, and obviously, is quite a lot of consideration, but particularly for our health workers, is commitments that have been made, particularly on sort of the change programme and safe working practices that were made within NDNA. Looking at the, the Finance Minister's statement, there's been no sort of definitive uh, discussion about how that's going to be paid for, apart from the fact that they'll have the first call on any sort of monitoring round or any monitoring round in June. So how do we get to the stage, but bearing in mind we're already talking about sort of uh, potential of moving over 200 million. Why can't that 200 million be being profiled towards health so health can have a much stronger commitment, particularly since our health workers will be saying, look, we have put everything on the line for COVID. We have worked well above the, the, the arrangements. It's part of the NDNA, and it's also part of the COVID approach. So why hasn't sort of things like health and indeed some of the areas of education already been ring-fenced for that particular area? 
The executive um, has yet to make decisions on how that 300 million will, will be allocated. I mean, I mean, the proposals for further rate support and obviously the DFE's proposal on their voucher scheme. In addition to the 200 million, we would expect to have our normal carry forward from this financial year into next financial year, and that that should be sufficient to honour the you know a commitment to health and first call engine monitoring for their safe staffing bid. So Joanne, Joanne, we would fully anticipate Joanne, the funding should be available. Sorry, what are you anticipating that carry forward is likely to be then? Well, at the moment, we're, we're obviously we don't know until we get near the end of the financial year. But as I said, we're, we're able to carry forward in the region of 80, 80 to 85 million. It may not be the full amount, but we, in general, carry forward a significant level of our budget of that available under the budget exchange scheme each year. So we we don't have the, the definitive figures. Obviously, departments are still working towards the end of the financial year, and it's early days yet to say what that will be. But we fully anticipate that it will be sufficient to cover those commitments that have been given. Okay, thanks. And look, the final one before opening up to the rest of the team is on the uh, victims' pension payments. We've had figures bandied around all over the place from 800 million, but I think the Justice Minister, and I, I will be careful of this because I haven't seen actually the answered transcript or rest of it, but said in her own committee she expected it to be somewhere closer to about 120 million. There's a huge delta difference between 800 million and 120 million. And if we look over a 10 year period, if it's 120 million and that works out, at, you know, uh, this year would be a higher figure, but would probably be based on about, about 10 million each. So what, what figure are you actually working to f for that process? Because look, um, we've got to have some sort of definitive figure on this because it is something that we're committed to, we're committed to legally, but if it's in the realms of the 120 million over 10 years, it's something we should be progressing fairly rapidly. So um, you know, can you give us an idea of what the figures are and where we are in actually bottoming that out? I, um, I don't have a definitive figure for it over the full lifetime of the scheme. Um, the executive office are currently working on refining the costings on that. I, unfortunately, I hadn't heard the 120 million figure. I had heard in the region, a median figure was in the region of 400, but again, I, I couldn't stand over that. It's not my figure. Um, in, in terms of planning of purposes, um, the executive office did submit a bid in the budget, which was in the region of, I think, 21 million. For that, they also bid for the sort of preparation costs, and we have funded the preparation cost bid in full, which allows work on that to progress, and that allows time for the ongoing discussions which are happening with the UK government on the funding of the payments themselves. So they put in a bid for 21 million, and they set up costs as well. Yes. So we could be using the 21 million for paying the victims' pension now, or once it's agreed. Well, you know, it's saying that they, they put in a bid for that. It wasn't allocated. What was allocated was the 6.7 for the preparation costs. As you'll be aware, um, we're, we're firmly of the view that the UK government have a responsibility here and discussions on that are ongoing with uh, FM, DFM, the Justice Minister and the Finance Minister seeking to meet with the Secretary of State to discuss that. OK, thanks. Jim? Jim uh, Minister, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jim. <laughs> so I noticed that the one department that's had a major hike in its resources is the executive office. What's that for? Jeff may have more detail over that than I do, but there are, as I say, there's a 6.7 in there for the preparation works for the victims' payments. There's funding in there for HIA. So all of those, and there's also funding in there for tackling paramilitary activity. Well, could you give us some breakdown of where this extra funding requirement, how it allocates between those? Yeah, um, eight million for tackling paramilitary activity, which would be the executive's element of that funding. We're still waiting on confirmation from the NIO that they will provide the match funding necessary on that. And um, six point seven. I... Sorry. Sorry, sorry, Joanne. Um, that eight, eight million actually is allocated to DOJ. The TEO uplift. Oh, sorry, sorry. The TEO uplift is based on the six point seven million in relation to victims, okay. and the eight point seven. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Sorry about that. And the eight point seven is for what? HIA. 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 So we've had on the victims' pension, we've had the Department of Justice uh, nominated as the relevant department. So why has that still been channeled through TEO? Those are the arrangements that are in place. I think 
TEO is responsible for providing the funding to DOJ. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not completely over the detail of the funding arrangements, but it was TEO that submitted the bid for that, and then they will provide the funding to Department of Justice, is my understanding. And TEO put in a bid, the Executive Office put in a bid for $21 million of actual pension funding. Is that right? Um, I'm just trying to check the exact $21 million was off the top of my head. Um, I'll see if I have the exact funding, or perhaps Jeff has the exact figures from the bid. I'll see if I can find that. Sorry, it's the problem with not working with paper. You can never find the right electronic document. Yes, you are correct, Joanne. It was victims payments, 21.6 million a bid from TEO. And the finance minister rejected that? The not executive so rejected that. Sorry? Yeah, it's not, not so much the executive made the decisions and the overall allocation. It's not a case of, of re rejecting bids, but looking at the overall funding that's available. And as I said, there are discussions ongoing with the, the Northern Ireland Office and the Secretary of State on that, yes, and yes, we're waiting for I a meeting. I understand that, but I want to be absolutely clear. The executive office asked for $21 million to be able to pay pension funds and through presumably a recommendation from the Department of Finance, that was rejected. Is that correct? Not entirely, not rejected no. as such. Correct. Um, departments identify their pressures as part of the, of the budget process, and that was a pressure. Um, it was supposed to have been, it was a pressure identified by the executive office. But the executive has agreed that there is a responsibility in the UK government yes. to provide funding this, and discussions are ongoing, and therefore the bid has been in some ways deferred until those discussions take place. So was that deferral on a recommendation from the finance minister? It was agreed by the executive. No, no, that's not the question, no. Ms McBurney. I'm asking, was it on a recommendation by the finance minister? It was not a recommendation that the bid was deferred as such as a recommendation on the overall budget position. And the resolution was we're not going to pay it, even though the executive office had asked for it, because we want to put the pressure on the NIO. We're not in a position to actually make payments yet. We're in a position that we are, you know, Department of Justice and TO are progressing the preparation costs, so there's no payments actually able to be made yet. Is the Secretary, so of, State, is the Secretary of State therefore correct when he rebukes your department for playing games over the victim's pension? I don't think it's appropriate for me to, call, uh, to comment on the political aspects no, I, I, of it. I, I, I don't I, think we're, I, we're playing. I, I, I accept that and sort of uh, we take that as well. But there is a question of clarity here: is that if that was the case, why did the TEO bid for 21.6 million, uh, which money, what I imagine, were to go to the Department of Justice for paying out of this? Why did they bid for it in the first place when it's a joint office if it was going to be rejected by the DO Department of Finance? I, 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 I would like some clarity on that. Yeah. I think it's not so much a matter of, of bidding for the money as identifying that there's a pressure and we recognise that victims' payments have to be made. Therefore, it's, it's proper and correct to identify what those pressures are so the executive is fully informed would it not be of equally, potential issues. Would it not, Sorry, would Jeff, it not be, do you want to? Would it not be equally proper and correct, having identified that pressure, to then provide the money within the budget, given that the pawns in this are the innocent victims? Hmm. Sorry. I, I, mean, I think we, we all fully sympathise with the victims, and there, I don't think there's any intention that payments to the victims would be delayed. We have funded the preparation costs in full to allow that work to progress. Right. No, no, I think, no, I think um, and sorry, I was using the chair's prerogative here, but the question that I am now confused about is I can understand the $6.4 million being allocated to set the system up. But I think the news, the information that is used to us, that there was also a bid in for $21 million. Which, bearing in mind, if we're considering it's towards the lower end of the costs, and there is also a court case that is saying that we must be paying, making these payments, I can't understand how, if a bid had been made, I would really like to understand the mechanism that it was taken out. And maybe, maybe, maybe to move it on slightly, if you could 
do a bit more research on that and get back to us fairly urgently on that uh, information. I well, think we would like to see just that. Just before yeah, you move on. Sorry, if I can jump in, I think that's partly my fault for referring to, to big as opposed to just simply departments identifying their pressures. It was, so what I'm referring to is sort of identified departments as part of an information gathering exercise and PO simply submitted what they an, an estimate of what they thought the cost would be this year. It wasn't a direct as such. That's my sloppy terminology. And this well, is definitely well, right. this is and, and therefore it wasn't rejected as such. It, it's just there are discussions ongoing and it hasn't been included in the draft budget. Jim, Jim, what, whatever, whatever the backpedaling, we know the executive office identified a need for 21 million so that a pension recipients could be paid. We now know that that was then not provided and therefore they won't be paid. No, that, that's, not, that's not the cost. That's not entirely true. We're not at the point, as far as I'm aware, the Department of Justice is not at the point of making payments yet. The scheme hasn't opened yet. Yes, Once it, that scheme opens, there is, of course, the requirement for funding to be provided for it. Yes. In their interim, there are discussions ongoing at a political level with the UK government. Tell me this, as far as your department and your minister are concerned, is it now just a question of who pays, or is it still a question of who gets? I obviously can't speak for the, the Minister of Political Matters. As far as I am concerned, there's, there's an obligation to pay the funding to victims for the scheme that has been legislated for. But are we not now into the territory to which the Secretary of State was referring of the Department playing games by trying to mix the issue of who pays with who gets? Hmm. I, I honestly, again, can't comment on political aspects, but I don't think so. I don't think there's games playing around trying to get the UK government to uphold its own statement of funding policy, okay. which does say that the department who introduces the policy pays for the policy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Matthew? Thank you. Thank you both. Um, it's getting slightly confusing to keep track of the various, I'm sure it is for the department too, to keep track of the various pots of um, uh, well, fresh start, new decade, new approach, confidence and supply. Um, but just so I'm um, absolutely clear the department's position is that it's flat cash for 21 22 because the amount the the 20 the 20, 20 incorporating new decade new approach uh, is in a sense continue that's your baseline that continues so yeah. you haven't lost the additional for, okay but it's just that yeah, well, yeah. We we have lost um, what happened when, when departments baselines are set, we used the previous year's budget position. Yeah. Last year, so the 2021 budget position it included 350 million of funding from New Decade New Approach. Mm -hmm. That funding is not available to the executive this year, but we haven't reduced departments baselines for that amount. So the executive before the spending review started, with, if you like, with, with a hole in the budget of that 350 million. There were other baseline adjustments through the spending review process our Treasury will remove one of funding. The net effect of that is when we got our spending review allocation, mm. although Treasury will say we got extra money, when you take account of what was already in our department's baselines and they already found the spending, we actually are facing flat cash. Okay. In terms of what's factored into this draft budget, um, in terms of Dale overall, uh, the 85 million, so there's a, a, a and in a sense, an automatic 85 million carry forward under the budget exchange scheme. Is that factored into this baseline? No, we, we can't factor any carry forward under the budget exchange scheme into the draft budget document for two reasons. Firstly, we don't know what that will be until we get to the end of the year, we get the partners provisional and then final outturn figures. And, and secondly, the draft budget can only reflect Treasury funding that has been set out in the Secretary of State's letter, and which our minister has laid out in a statement to the family 14 days, at least 14 days before he sets out the draft budget. But you've so none of that has been factored in, and that will be taken account of early in the last year, either in the June monitoring round or earlier. If you, if you, you, so you can't do that in terms of the in terms of your what's in the draft budget, uh, like in terms of the the tables and what's officially submitted to the no. assembly but you could insert text in the document to say we have the expectation that there would be so you said 
85 million carry forward under the budget exchange scheme. It sounded like relative confidence the 200 million would be added to that as so be, that's 285. Would it, would it be would it have been useful to have an additional text in the document or in, in the ministerial statement to say that we are relatively confident there will be an additional 285 added to this number? I, I think until we have it confirmed, it would be misleading to tell people that it will definitely be there, which may have happened if we'd have put it in the, in, in the, the document itself. Okay. The 200 million um, of the COVID funding, I would hope we'd have confirmation quite soon on that, right. and that's something that then could be reflected, hopefully not in the final budget figures, but in the text behind the final budget. On the 85 million, that's the limit we could carry forward in our budget exchange scheme. As I say, it is my feeling that we will carry forward a significant amount of level under that. I don't have any degree of certainty in that, mm -hmm. other than sort of past experience and, and feedback maybe we're getting from departments. So again, it would be a bit um, early to factor that into any budget plans, other than to say, I think we will carry forward a significant amount. And when I answered the question, it was in relation to safe staffing for DOH, and I think they're their ask in relation to that was around 15 million. So if you compare 15 million to a maximum carry forward of 85 million, I think we can be relatively comfortable. Yeah. We okay. should get enough carry forward to cover that. Fair enough. And on, because this is obviously completely inseparable from the monitoring round position, um, do you know when we'll get the final January monitoring round? We've been told. I would, I would hope we're, we're hoping to get that tabled at the executive tomorrow. Obviously, no certainty on that, but we would hope that you that it would be with you very shortly on, okay. on the January monitoring. Obviously, we're working to timescales in relation to spring supplementary estimates Absolutely. as well, so it's something yeah. that needs to be uh, you know completed quite soon. Can you give us a sense of what the what your sort of global number is in terms of mm -hmm. uh, resource underspend at the minute? We're obviously aware that there seems to the most um, dramatic adjustments seem to be, all indications seem to be in the Department of the Economy is where the most dramatic adjustments would be, but could you give us a global number in terms of, I know it, you're not really comparing apples with pears, but you're, you are comparing apples with pears, but can you give us a rough sense of what the global underspend might be? I don't really think it would be appropriate for me to comment on that. Fair enough. Okay. Um, and on uh, RRI borrowing, um, sorry, just, uh, just, sorry, sorry, Joanne, but I think one of the things we have at the moment is you'll, have, you'll already know through monitoring a, a quantum figure. Are we talking about tens of millions or are we talking about 100 million? Because already we're looking at sort of 285 million that we're being invited to look at that we may or may not have, which would have a significant impact on how we're looking at any budget process. You would have already and because you've already told us and you know you're doing monthly updates and keeping a careful eye on sort of sort of the flow and expenditure of both uh, and particularly in resource at the moment so you'll have known for a, you should have a a, a sort of a, a rough estimate are we talking tens of millions or are we talking more because you know if that's the case we're looking at close on half a billion difference in what's been put forward from a draft budget that's likely to be the the out, the out, the outturn well, well, firstly, um, the monitoring round relates, as you know, to this financial year. Um, we are not that the, the, the two hundred million we have said um, we are hoping to carry forward. So that relates more to next year. In, in terms of global figures, yes, it would be at the higher end of the estimates. If you refer to yourselves, um, part of our economy is looking to carry forward the funding for its high street voucher scheme. That in itself is eight, is ninety five million. So that sort of gives an indication of some of the funding that has been returned to the executive to consider for reallocation. So yes, it is certainly going to be at the higher end can of I, those figures. Sorry, go ahead, Matthew. Thank you. Can I just ask a, really, a, bit, one, a couple of other things to ask, but I'll try and be really brief in my questions. Um, are there any uh, conversations going on in terms of novel ways to, as it were, get the money out the door uh, in, the, in extremis? I think throughout the COVID situation, there have been a number of, of discussions ongoing mm. between departments, ministers and officials on the best ways to provide support and use that funding, and, and those conversations are continuing and will continue between now and the end of the financial year. Thank you, Joanne. That was a very good white, white hall uh, answer there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very, uh, I respect that. Um, on EU income, um, the, um, uh, so the... Um, 
Obviously, CAP monies have been replaced by UK government monies, um, albeit we don't know uh, what the UK government's long-term commitment to um, farm payments is. Um, but there is uh, lost structural funding. In a sense, um, what, what, in a sense, that is being so. You're, the, the flat cash position is in part a product of lost EU funding as well. Um, Jeff will correct me if I'm wrong, but but the, not really because the EU funding would have come in as receipts, whereas we're looking at a net position. So yeah, yeah. there is a, there is a huge impact from that lost EU funding, and um, our minister and the other default ministers have made no secret of the fact they're not happy with the way the Share Prosperity Fund is being managed or is intended to be managed. So yes, there are, hu there are huge impacts from that, but I don't think you could say there's a direct read across to, to the, the budget figures as such because of the way EU income would score basically as a negative in our, our budget. Okay, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, but albeit it is worth saying that it scores as a negative, but uh, it, you, you factor it into your spending plans. So because you know you're going to have, you're not going to have that receipt to score it means you're going to assign, you're going to allocate let fewer, less money to departments, so it, it is reflected. Yeah, it, it's it's not a case of so much of allocating less money to departments. If we were getting EU funding in, departments would spend more, and that would be offset by a negative amount to the UK income. So in the figures yeah. that we show, you really wouldn't see it because it would be a plus and a minus, which would cancel each other out. So it doesn't really show in our figures as such. But what it does mean is behind those figures, is, say for the Department for Economy. While we have a net figure for the Department of Economy there, if they were getting EU income, they would spend much more than that net figure. They're now not in that position to do so. So it, it impacts the spending plans of departments, but it doesn't directly sort of show itself in our figures as such. I, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, it, it, it does have an impact, but it doesn't, the way yeah, it counts. It doesn't um, show clearly. And my, and, my, and my final question is uh, oh, just, about... Just, just one another. Okay. One of the things we've been trying to bottom out is a figure from the Department of Economy that said that they're short of... 45 million for invest ni could you could confirm that figure is that roughly the figure we're looking at i honestly don't have those figures in front of me at the minute but it's something we can look at and get back to you all okay yes please and then my i turn over to others now but my final question uh unless i can squeeze back in uh at the end is um there's a, cer a certain amount of money that, that um frustrates me in particular which is two and a half million that we spend every year on um uh on, on subsidising flights which have not existed in three years. Can I ask why the Department does not ask the Treasury to discontinue this subsidy, given that, not, notwithstanding the fact that there have been no flights from Northern Ireland to North America or indeed anywhere else in Band 2 APD for the past three years, even if there were, um, very few of them would have taken off in the past year because the aviation industry has collapsed. I'm just wondering what are, what are the what's the disbenefit of going to the Treasury and saying can we have a look at this again so we don't have to hand over take two million out of the block grant every year for literally nothing? I mean, I, I think you make a fair point, and I think um, our minister has went on the record. I may be wrong, but I think he's on the record. He's happy to look at that, and I think that's something we can consider. Okay, okay. thank you, okay. Philip. Can you hear us, Philip? I can ask Assembly Broadcasting to add uh, Philip McGuigan back to the spotlight. There he is. There you go. Yep. Over to you. Uh, am I good to go? Yeah, you're good, Philip. Uh, thanks. So, I mean, just in, in terms of, of su summarising uh, this, I mean, essentially, what we have been given, courtesy of, of the British government purse for the North, you know, it's a flat cash, so there's no increase to the budget on last year. It's a single year budget, even though the executive and all of us would like uh, a multi year budget uh, to have a bit more certainty in terms of planning. Uh, there's still money that hasn't come or been committed to by the British Secretary of State for NDNA commitments uh, for EU structural funding, as, as Matthew and Steve ha have talked about, uh, and for city deals. and. So, I mean, that's essentially where we're at. So, the executive, uh, as the minister said in the assembly the other day, isn't able to prepare uh, or kickstart our economy as we come out of COVID uh, as we would like. Uh, so, I mean, on the back of that, I mean, can I just ask a number of questions? Because M Matthew and Steve talk, touched on EU structural fund. I mean, obviously, the British government had said that uh, we wouldn't lose out uh, funding as a result of leaving the EU, and, and, and already that has proven not to be the case. But I've seen figures. I mean, obviously, we've heard of the 45 million for the Department for Economy, but I think in either 
the minister's statement the other day around the budget uh, consultation, there's a figure of 69 million. So perhaps if I could get some clarity, is that 69 million to in totality or is that for the Department for the Economy or what would be um, what's the impact across all the departments in terms of the loss of EU structural funding? And then secondly, and, and I know you did touch a bit about it, on it, Joanne, uh, in your introduction. Just where are we exactly on discussions with uh, uh, the British Secretary of State on the NDA money, the confidence to supply money, the city deal money? You know, when do we expect those uh, talks to be concluded and, and how positive do we expect the results to be of those talks? Okay. Um, taking your first question, you're absolutely right with your, your summary of of what's in the draft budget and, and what's not is a very clear summary of that. In terms of the EU structural funds, my understanding, and Jeff might correct me if I'm wrong, is that the 69 million is, is the global figure for all departments, whereas the Department for Economy is down to 45 million. But we can correct that if, if I'm, I'm wrong because I don't have EU funding numbers in front of me. Um, so, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but so then the 69, where's the other 24 million from? I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have the breakdown of the funding in front of me. Jeff may have, but he's not nodding at me. So one of the one of the one of the um, the issues here is I think there's a broadly similar amount. I think maybe the minister was was talking about 69 million in terms of the EU protocol, which is a slightly different issue, mm -hmm. um, and it's funding specifically for implementing the protocol, which we had we had requested 69 million for 21, 22, and to date the the um, there's only been about 35.3 million of that has been agreed so that might be where the 69 million is coming from okay i think just taking out of that i think we undertake to come back to you with clearer figures on the, on the eu side of things that'll be helpful soon as we we don't have the definitive figures with us um on the mdna i mean as i've said we secretary of state has unfortunately not confirmed that that funding in his letter to us in december when he confirmed getting the outcome Discussions are ongoing. I don't have a firm date for when we have an answer for that. We would hope it would be in time for the final budget, but we certainly anticipate that the funding will be provided next year with no reason to doubt that. It would just be good to get clarity on that sooner rather than later. Okay, and, and that there is affecting city deals and confidence and supply money as well. Then. It's the same issue. It, it's the same issue. It wasn't included in the Secretary of State's letter where he said about what our funding envelope was for this year, so we couldn't include it in the draft budget. But oh. We don't think that that means we, you know, we don't anticipate that means the funding can't be spent. It's a matter of getting that confirmation so that we can include it formally in our plans. Okay, and then just a couple of our very brief questions, Chair. Uh, how much money has been allocated uh, in terms towards the competition of Casement Park, and will that project uh, commence this year? And then just lastly, how much money has been allocated in the budget towards welfare mitigation? Um, the casement figure is, um, unless Jeff corrects me, 20 million capital, and I would like to think that that means it will start this year because otherwise the Department for Communities would not have submitted a bid for that amount. In terms of the welfare reform, we replaced the money that would have been in the SC's baseline for last year. Jeff will correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was about 41.8 million and topped it up by a further 1 million. That's correct, and yes. That's, that's providing those mitigations at, at, at existing levels. It's not new mitigations, it's, it's at existing levels. Yeah. Yeah. I Sorry, I broke up there. I didn't quite get it. Was that 20 million for casement and 42.8 for welfare mitigation? Yes, that's right. Okay, Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Okay, Gemma. Uh, Gemma on uh, Spotlight, please. Start Eve. Start Eve. Oh, whatever. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Um, I have a couple of questions as well. Just um, obviously, the timeline for the consultation for the budget is tight. Um, what strategy is in place to ensure maximum input from interested sectors? And then on the budget, um, what's the timeline? And forgive me, I should probably know this, but what's the timeline of the process from the point when the consultation closes? Okay, well, consultation closes on, on the 25th of February. So obviously the budget document is out there and everyone is encouraged to reply to responses to that. In addition to that, um, our team of public spending directorate will do a number of consultation events with sectoral bodies such as NICFA. Um, Jeff, Jeff could actually provide probably the list of those to you. It might more clarity because my mind has went black. Jeff, Jeff, do you want to run down some of the people that you'll be contacting and offering consultation events to? Sure. Um, let me just get that the details of that and. Um... 
sorry, oh, I talk so, on my chat. Sorry, you got that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll be looking at talking to NICFA. Um, we are approaching all the main unions, uh, the Confederation of British Industry, the Federation of Small Businesses, the Equality Commission, Constructors Employ Construction Employers Federation, the Institute of Directors, the Women's Policy Group, which is a, uh, effectively the Women's Resource and Development Agency, the Northern Ireland Food and Drink Association, Public Sectors, Sector Chairs Forum, Social Enterprise NI, Trade NI, Retail NI, Rating Policy, um, the Public Sector Chairs Forum, sorry, that's a, that's a double count there, um, Hospitality Ulster, um, NICS Non-Executive Directors and the Human Rights Commission. Uh, we're, we're open um, to, to talking to anyone who, who's able to, to come and wants to, to understand a wee bit more about the budget process. Yeah, no, that's great, Jeff. thanks. It was just the women's sector I was worried about. Um, I just saw a couple of tweets that concerned me, but thanks for that. And my other question is, and I know the minister had been looking for greater flexibility, but if we're allowed to carry forward COVID money, obviously that's a big if, does it have to be spent on COVID related areas or projects um, or can it go to other departments or projects? Right. So far the executive has, has sort of um, looked at the COVID funding separately from the normal funding because it's important obviously to provide support for COVID. But our understanding certainly is that it's coming forward, it's coming through eventually through the normal Barnett formula and that means that it could be spent on other things but obviously the executive would want to consider what supports needed for COVID and wouldn't want it to go to sort of an, on day-to-day -day departmental pressures but if supports needed in another area maybe you know not strictly linked to COVID that would be a matter for the executive and I think that, that flexibility would be available to them. Okay great no thank you that's all that's all my questions thank you. Chair Chairman thanks uh, Matthew short one. Yeah it, it is quite it, 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 it's just a couple of related ones but they're both short what is the final date by which you need to get this budget presented to the assembly so the closing date for the consultation is the 25th of feb it, it, can it be basically any day before, before the financial year yeah yeah i mean it, it needs to be in place before the 31st of march obviously yeah. we would rather sooner rather than later but then again we'd have rather um, been able to do a draft budget in early autumn like we would normally plan to do so yeah anytime before the 31st of march but, but sooner if possible to is provide clarity as okay. possible but we obviously do also need to give time to work through the consultation responses you know we need to consider those that come in and give them our full consideration so it, it can't be turned around in a matter of days after that closing mm -hmm. date but you but i presume you would also be factoring into your planning the uk budget on the 3rd of march we will do, but in normal course of events, while we may get some additional funding out of the 3rd of March, it doesn't tend to lend itself to great amounts. It's also likely that we may not be able to factor anything that does come in on the 3rd of March in their final budget because of that requirement for the Secretary of State to write and confirm revised control tools and for our Minister to make a statement to the Assembly at least 14 days before he lays the budget on what those control tools are. But, so it may be that funding coming out on the 3rd of March has to be factored into a monitoring round as right. opposed to in the final okay. budget. But, but just, and I'm not, wouldn't accuse you of this at all, Joanna, if I have very full confidence in the department, but given that we know we're in, the, we could have nearly 300 million in carry forward, uh, something from the Secretary of State, and I agree the Secretary of State is, is not uh, behaving well in relation to Northern Ireland, but likely there'll be some further permissions from him, in terms of a letter in funding, and possibly further Barnet consequentials from the, tre from the budget on the 3rd of March. Would it be cynic? Would, it, would I be a cynic if I was saying that the draft budget is quite a low number and there's a presentational advantage to um, to, to the fact that we're going to have an the, the, the number will inevitably be higher whenever the final budget comes out? As I'm not accusing you of that, I'm just. No, I, I honestly don't think so. I mean, I think there's two things to be taken into account here. One is the level of COVID funding and the. the the carry forward we are, I suppose, hoping for and anticipating the 200 million is for COVID, yeah. and that does not, should not really affect departmental normal spending power. So I don't think you know we're being disingenuous when we say it's a very challenging budget position. Yeah. Also, in terms of sort of non-COVID carry forward, we would always expect to be able to carry forward some funding with the best will in the world. Departments do tend to underspend as it comes towards the end of the year, and there's always some funding carried in. So I don't think we're being disingenuous when we say it's a very, very challenging budget to say to departments, basically, we're rolling forward your baselines for last year and, and topping up a little bit. No, I, you I, take I, a, I, I, you know, inflation. I don't think you're being disingenuous, and it definitely is. Pressures. And it definitely is uh, a, a tight spending settlement, from, including from, from the UK government. But uh, it's also true that there's a, the numbers are probably going to go up from here. 
Mm -hmm. well, that, we would not need that hope, so be enough, I think but, would be the, okay. we would hope so. Okay. Okay, thanks. Jim? Uh, John, when you finished this committee, you wish you'd, you'd have done something simple in life, like brain surgery or nuclear <laughs> physics. And I noticed that you're taking most of the flack, and your colleague is wasn't flack. Oh, yeah, no, wasn't flack at all. I was keeping a low it. profile and only dipping in when he's got it up on his screen. So, jo 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 Joanne is a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say that, Chair. I know Jeff is there definitely to keep me right. He'll probably say he would love to be the one doing the talking, but he can't get a word in edgewise. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll have to give him much more priority in, in the <laughs> next round of tougher questions. <laughs> and I'm sure you've missed this process over the last four years um, when you haven't had to do this. But can I move you on to the thorny issue of McLeod? What assumption, yes. if any, have you built into McLeod? And have you built into it that the, uh, the restitution will only go up to um, April 2022? OK. Um, first, we're, we're very aware of the, the McLeod issue. Um, it isn't. You're correct. It is not factored into the draft budget position. The feedback we're getting from Treasury is obviously that this does not just affect Northern Ireland and that we would get Barnet consequentials and any additional funding provided to Whitehall departments for that. Obviously, when that time comes, we will need to then consider whether that's sufficient to cover the pressures that we have, and we may have to take action if it's not. Right. So um, you're assuming two things there, that there will be no expenditure rising in the incoming budget year of 21-22 as a direct result of Not necessarily. And secondly, you're assuming that if any cost, and the cost is very significant to the Northern Ireland Office budget, or the Northern Ireland budget and the Northern Ireland Office budget, you're assuming that all of that would be met through a Barnet consequential coming from London rather than coming out of our block grant? Firstly, we're not assuming that there won't be any payments during this next financial year. We haven't built it into the, the draft budget because at this point in time we wouldn't have a figure to build in because we don't know whether the executive will be facing a pressure or whether the Barnet will be sufficient to cover that. Our hope, of course, would be that if it's on a sort of population share that Barnet of the funding provided to Whitehall departments for the same issue would be sufficient. If it's not, then yes, that's something we will need to, to and the executive will need to consider. And you're all right, it has the potential to be a very significant pressure. But there's absolutely but there's absolutely no way that uh, if it was taken out of the Northern Ireland Office block grant that that could be done without knocking a major hole in that for 22-23. So I'm a wee bit worried that you don't seem to have had confirmation that in that year it will be coming from Westminster rather than from the block grant. We have confirmation that we will get Barnet on Whitehall Department's allocations. That's only a small you're proportion. you're absolutely right. If, if that is not... You mean, that would mean we, we don't know whether that would be sufficient to cover all of the pressure. We would like to hope that it would, or at the very least, we'd anticipate it would cover a significant amount of that pressure, leaving us with a smaller pressure to address through our own block grant. But Whitehall is only a very small proportion of the liability when you take in, for instance, health service pensions, teachers, etc. I mean, the Whitehall would only cover MOD, um, NIO, and expenditure like that. It won't, won't cover 82% of the budget. I mean, the liability will, if it falls on the block grant, 82% of it falls on our money, not, not Whitehall's. Well, Whitehall departments, I mean, I'm, I'm not a pensions expert. I'm not completely over the numbers. As I say, it hasn't been factored into the draft budget as yet, but I'm aware of the discussions with the Treasury, and Whitehall departments will be facing those pressures. So we do need to do a bit of work to, I suppose, estimate what our pressure is and what that will be, what we could anticipate via Barnet. And we'll have those discussions with Treasury over the coming months. We'd need to. Um, I, I think maybe. I, I think maybe to to clarify here, if there are pressures on the health service in England pensions, we will get an equivalent amount through Barnet for our um, our pressures here. So it's not just about the narrow area of Whitehall. It's about talking about all the GB departments, uh, health, um, and so on and so forth. So it, it, it's. It, we, we would expect that that number will be very close to um, covering the, 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 the potential pressure here. Okay. And we have that tied down already. That's confirmed. That, that Treasury, we... at, at official level, Treasury have indicated that we will get Barnet, and, and that would be the way the Barnet formula would work. If a, a Whitehall Department gets an additional allocation, we do get Barnet on it. We have no reason to doubt that. And Treasury officials, we have asked this specific question in relation to McLeod, and they have confirmed that Barnet will operate. 
Right. Uh, in writing, not on the back of a taxi in London, in writing, you've got confirmation that we're getting this. I, I have. I have an email from Treasury that says that Barnet will apply in the case of additional funding from Treasury to English departments on MacLeod. Okay, well, that, 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 that's, that's very good news. Uh, w well done on that. Now, um, as you know, the major supermarkets have announced, either they've given or they're about to give, um, a, a refund of the very substantial amount of money that has been given in the form of rate relief. Are we expecting a bit of a windfall in 20? 122 in the form of that again our three percent is that coming to us or has it been retained by london no it, it will come to us and our treasury are working on that at the minute and um, there has been no time period given for those supermarkets or, or indeed other businesses who wish to repay their rates there's been no time scale given for them to do that it's purely voluntary they can do it whenever they want um treasury will look any funding that flows through treasury should say a large supermarket chain decide to pay the money for the whole of the UK as one lump sum and channel that through Treasury, they will make sure that we get our share of that funding money. Alternatively, they may decide to pay the element of support that was provided by the Northern Ireland Executive back through our own rates people. That's also a possibility, but either way we will get the money, but we don't know when is, is the issue at the moment. And has that been built into the estimates for 21-22, or is it going to come as a very pleasant windfall? We can't build it into any of our budget figures because we don't know, one, which supermarkets are repaying it, how much they will repay or when they will repay it. So, no, we haven't factored it in and it will be hopefully a windfall and well, hopefully very pleasant. Yeah, well, so I think at least three of them have announced that they are going to repay it and they're all very big players in the Northern Ireland market. So, you know, that would be very pleasant to know there's a wee bit of money uh, coming through. Finally, what assumption have you built in for health service pay uh, for 21-22? Um, I'm going to look to Jeff see if he has details on, on the assumption, but, but we've covered the agenda for change pay. Um, we have was, was basically there's funding in NDNA for agenda for change pay, which we're anticipating will come. And we have the executive in its draft budget has met the difference between what the <coughs> health provision for that and what the, will be funded through the NDNA once we get confirmation of that. And have you a specific percentage figure built into the budget? I don't have it in front of me. I'm sure we can probably get that. I'm looking at Jeff. I don't think he would have it either. Like three percent, two percent. You haven't. Uh... It's whatever the, the requirements of agenda for change were, and the pressure that the Department for Health identified. We, we can find that out for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Pat. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Um, I have a few questions. I may double up on with something people have asked because I just didn't really understand there with it. Um, I know the minister called it, uh, uh, his term for it was a standstill budget. Um, I don't know how you juggle the figures. To me, it looks like it's a shotgun budget because <laughs> you're dragging so many people to the altar to get an I will out of them. And there's no guarantee that it's going to happen. Uh, the current position in terms of the funding discussed with the Secretary of State and the remaining outstanding funding issues of, with the NDNA conference supply and the city deal. Um, how reliable is the estimate and cost as well for the victims and pensions? The Minister indicated a commitment to deliver the victims and pensions, but as of yet, to provide the necessary funding, and we hear that it's £800 million. I mean, there is no guarantee, we don't see any guarantee uh, that that's going, or where that money is going to come from. Uh, also, just to go back to uh, when you were speaking there on the the, uh, the reference was made to the Dara money, I think it was £67 million uh, for the baseline treatment of the, Cagre, uh, the Common Agriculture Policy Funding. Um, that is coming out of the 100 of the 126 million. That's COVID money that was held back. And I have another question just on the back of that for the £200 million. Pounds, uh, which is meant to come back from the supermarkets. There's no guarantee that that's going to come back. And someone's already asked, how can we hold? You've never been really been able to hold anything over 80 million back in the budgets. 
How confident are you that we will be in these COVID times be able to hold back? I know I've fired about five questions at you there, but I mean, if I was asking you all the questions you've written down, we'd be here all night. So I'm just trying to get some tie into it, Joanne, please. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if I managed to capture all those questions. I was, I was trying to write some of them, them down there. Um, I suppose um, in terms of the, the victims funding, we have funded the preparation cost and the executive is committed to providing the funding for the payments, but there's an ongoing discussion. The yes, there are a range of figures. The executive is doing some more work on refining those figures. Uh, the figures range up millions. Obviously, hoped it would be less than that, but that, that's the cost over the lifetime of the scheme. The cost in the, in the incoming financial year, which is much as looking at, is estimated by the executive office to be around 24 million. So that's what we're looking at in this year. In terms of the DERA funding, yes, the UK government has provided the replacement EU funding for CAP, and that is included in this budget. I think it was around. I think it was around 300 Joanne, million for that. I'm just coming in again through the chair. Do you know how much of that has been spent? Off the, that money which was for there for for how much of that has been spent? I know it's been earmarked for it, but how much of that has been spent by Dara? Um well, the funding in the budget is looking at next year, so I'm presuming that the amount that they have will be fully committed, but they haven't spent any of that yet this year. Again, I would assume that they'll spend the amount that they've been provided for, but I don't have the details on their on their spend to date this year. As such, in, in terms of the, the supermarkets, yes, we haven't factored any of that in, and we don't have a figure for that as yet. That is slightly different from the 200 million. The, the 200 million we were referring to is funding that the Treasury uplifted the, the guaranteed COVID funding, which they've said we'll get in 2122 by 200 million just before Christmas, I think it's the 23rd of December. Um, and you're right, completely right, we have limited carry forward under the normal arrangements, but also under previous year's arrangements, if we're provided with funding, notification of funding very late in the financial year, in what Treasury would refer to as their spring socks, so around sort of December, January time, there is a precedent that funding that's provided to the devolved administrations late in the year is permitted to be carried forward if we wish to do so, because Treasury do recognise that if they only notify us that funding is available in December, January time, that gives us very little time to spend that money effectively. So we have discussed with Treasury at the local level and the indication that was made are positive that we would be able to carry that 200 million forward. Finance Minister has written formally with the other devolved finance ministers to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, giving formal confirmation of that 300 million, and then the funding is seen between now and the end of the year will be allowed to carry forward. In addition, the devolved finance ministers are also seeking further flexibility to carry forward higher levels of funding if they choose to do so. And we still haven't got a response with the Secretary of the Treasury, not that we'll get that within the next week. So, um, I see. So, I'm all right here, Chair, just for another yes, moment. Just to, so, thanks very much. But it still, it still leaves me probably, I'm, I'm still have great difficulty in understanding how you can do the budget. I'm just using that from my own experience, you know, and how we budgeted within business because it, it just leaves there's so many holes and there's so many loose ends that I, I can see the difficulties in it. But the 92 million voucher scheme, uh, is it likely to be delivered in 21-22? Is that money allowed to be carried over on spent cash uh, from the COVID funding? And suppose the bottom line comes for the 126 million of COVID money. Uh, for the, for the refinement of pressures, does the department do you have any clear plans for this remaining fund? Um, yeah, if I start with the, the voucher scheme, obviously it's for the Department for Economy and the Executive to determine whether the voucher scheme will be delivered next year. Obviously, the Department for Economy has indicated the desire to have that money carried forward. We haven't approached Treasury specifically for carrying forward the voucher scheme. What we have on the 200 million, which obviously the been executive chief sufficient, along with the 126.9 million allocated well, money would be sufficient to cover those issues if the executive chose to do that. 
On the 126.9 million, departments did identify further proposals for COVID spending as part of the, of the draft budget, and those will be refined if we work through with as we get to final budget. As the money doesn't need to be spent or can't be spent on first of April onwards, there will be proposals in place for spending that money by the time we, we get there. Okay. I think I'll just send the rest in, in a wee letter then to you. will be here all night. Listen, Joanne, thanks very much. Oh, yes, thank you, and thank you, Joanne. You've been, this is a marathon session for you, both, uh, as you would expect, with a draft budget. So thank you very much for your time. I really do appreciate your answers. One thing I am confused about, though, uh, with regards to your dialogue, is that uh, I'm confused as to when a bid isn't a bid and whenever there's a pressure, it's a pressure. So we have, as you had said to a question, I think, from Matthew, uh, that the Department of Communities bid for their welfare mitigations of 48.4 million, and then even Casement Park was mentioned at 20 million. Now, welfare mitigations, to me, is something quite similar, although no, not exact, to what we're trying to achieve with the welfare, with the uh, victim's pension. People who have been grievously hurt and, and need support and help and have had done so all their life and will continue for the rest of their lives. So when is a bid not a bid and when is a pressure not a pressure? Because if the Department of Communities surely bid for that mitigation for welfare reform and they would know best what they require, why then is the Executive Office bid of £21.6 million for victims, not a bid. I suppose you're absolutely right in, in the need for the funding. And we have the utmost sympathy for the victims and that have invited that funding will have to be provided and these payments will have to be in, in terms of the differences, I sort of clarify the difference between bits and pressures with the way that we saw information. Was as part of the information gallery exercise on what their pressures were as opposed to the office to get the bids. In terms of the difference between the welfare mitigation, those welfare mitigations have been in place for some time. Uh, they were due to come to an end this financial year, given the um, situation with COVID, that was or seemed to be unreasonable. Um, so the Department of Communities, because those mitigations have been in place and process been in place to pay that funding out. They will need that funding if those mitigations are continued from the first of the April. In terms of the victim payment, the scheme is it's still being established and, and things will not flow as quickly as that. And also there are these ongoing discussions with the Secretary of State on that issue. So whereas the welfare mitigations have already been undertaken by the executive. So and again you're Cutting in and out there, Joanne, so forgive me if I uh, ask a question that you've already answered. Uh, forgive me for that. B but what we do know, and what the Justice Minister has stated, and, and the OFM and DFM has stated also, or sorry, FM and DFM have stated also, is that they want this scheme opened this next financial year. Mm -hmm. now, now, notwithstanding the argument about who pays, surely if that has been a public utterance from more than one minister in an executive, surely we cannot fail these victims any longer. And, and surely then, because of that, we need to mitigate for that risk of failure by adding and accepting a bid or for money to be placed at the centre or to, to any department in order to fund that, notwithstanding an argument that we would have with the Secretary of State or with the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That there is a commitment to provide that uh, for those kind of kind of efforts, and absolutely that that should be done. Um, in terms of funding, we have provided the six point seven million cost to allow the progress of the scheme. So we're absolutely not holding anything up that that funding is provided as it was last year to allow that work to continue. This last year to allow that work to continue. But but that that's that's um, um, yeah. that's a hollow. Okay, well, that's a hollow Sorry. promise because what you're doing there, you're using that money to build up the infrastructure and the, the staff and uh, the setting, the equipment in order to administer the fund. But if there's nothing channeling through that infrastructure, well, then it's not of any use. Uh, it just strikes me as being really bad form that these victims need so much assistance 
have been failed for so many years, but yet we now are holding out. What would, what would have been wrong by adding in 21.6 million, adding it in, factoring it in to this draft budget in the hope that that money would drop, be drawn down to the victims. And if some sort of, and I accept it is a political decision, uh, was made or an agreement or arrangement was made with the government in order to either fund that in its totality or part fund it. But surely to hold off, it, it sounds and smacks and smells like brinkmanship. And ultimately, the only people that will suffer are the people who have been suffering for years and years due to terrorism. Just, just, um, to, be, um, just to cut across there, um, this is new information that we've had today about this £21.6 million that was bid for by the TEO, as well as the £6.4 million. Uh, again, because this is finance, I think that we need a degree of clarity to this. and I propose that we write to the TEO and to the Finance Minister for details of what was bid for and what was the intention of the bid of the TEO, because, quite frankly, I'm confused because if it's a justice issue, why did justice not bid for the 21.6? Why did the TEO bid for the uh, 21.6 and the 6.4? And why had the bid been turned down? So I think, as a committee, I would like to see some clarity of that if we are agreed are we agreed? Are we content? Yeah, and sort of, and, and Joanne, I don't want to keep on sort of, sort of harking on with this, but it, it is new information for us to do that as well. Well, do you have so, any other? So, Joanne, just on that, why, why would we fund, or why would the Department of Finance fund an office that can't do anything? Why would you populate an office with staff and equipment that can't do anything? Hmm. I, I don't think the intention is that the office can't do anything. I think. The preparation costs were funded to allow that office to be set up to ensure that there's no delays in the interim there are discussions ongoing on the most appropriate method of funding that this is a draft budget there's a final budget to come when decisions could be taken there's also as you as we have talked about the potential for further money to be available next year so i think it's important to allow space for, for the discussions to continue while allowing the work to progress to ensure there's no delays on on the payments being provided to the victims what mechanism is in place to add and insert money to this draft budget and, and in effect, the real budget when it's passed uh, early on this financial year. If, if that 6.4 million is spent effectively and efficiently and there's a, an operation set up, an office, secretariat, whatever you call it, set up, which then can administer the pension scheme and there would be some sort of agreement, one way or the other, that we would start paying out pensions. What mechanism is in place, other than monitoring round, I suspect, that could get money down quickly to ensure that those pensions go out as quickly as possible? Well, first, firstly, there is the final budget. We're in the draft budget, which is out for consultation. The executive will then make decisions on its final budget, so that would provide one opportunity to amend the draft budget allocations. Or whatever purpose the executive chooses then as you rightly say there are there are the monitoring rounds uh, in addition as we've shown this year with our response to COVID, if there's a need for urgent funding to be provided the executive can do so at any point in time so who, who makes that decision so you have a draft budget out to consultation will be consulted upon also it then goes all the findings go back to the department of finance who then adapts or changes or alters the draft budget? The executive as a whole makes decisions on its final budget as the executive on the whole agrees that the, the draft budget is before you today. The finance minister may make proposals on that, but it's for the executive to make the decisions and it's for the executive to agree both the draft and the final budget. So, so I, I get that the executive must agree the budget and the final budget and the draft budget, but the minister, finance minister would always tell us that he can only furnish bids that come to him. Yeah. So I suppose what I'm asking is, what role, what important, significant role does the Finance Minister have in bringing forward his best guess budget to that executive? And how does that process actually work? So something must just, so it just doesn't appear at the executive and they decide. Something must happen that he produces a paper that looks like a budget and then the executive yeah. agrees. 
And I spoke. Yeah. So, so, as, as a normal process in uh, both the budget and the monitoring departments put forward their spending proposals. Um, Department of Finance look at the overall level of funding available. The Finance Minister puts uh, recommendations to the Executive and the Executive make decisions based on that. The Executive can make changes to the Finance Minister's recommendations. Okay. So that, that's a very important point. So whenever the Minister, Finance Minister brings his final proposals, then the Executive, it's not just a yes or no. They can actually make al propose alterations. Can they? Can a, can a minister of the executive make proposals to alter another minister's budget line? Uh, obviously, I don't sit in the executive meetings, but yes, the, the executive will discuss those issues. And if the executive as a whole agrees, I, I don't see any reason why not. But I, I don't sit in the executive, and that question may more properly, I suppose, be put into the executive office. Okay. On what is appropriate of the executive or not. Okay. But thank, you. It, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, to, Paul. To move on from that, one wee question then on the COVID funding. Yep. Uh, so, so you've got this money left over, and I have every sympathy, uh, Joanne, for you and your team whenever you're getting a windfall of money in de January and December. Uh, absolutely no problem. But we know that there's been money sitting in the centre from the very first monitoring round. Yeah. And that money still equates to the same amount of money. So ultimately, when we ask for money to, to be carried over, what we're really saying is that even in this hour of need, even in this great uh, days of challenge to businesses, and of all the years that I've been here, I've never yet heard a minister of a department say that they've too much money and they need and in fact I hear them all the time saying they haven't enough money and the big bad British government isn't providing for them. So what I'm saying is, is this not a failure in this day of need and great challenge that we haven't been able to remove that money from the centre quickly enough or quicker in order to get money down to support businesses that this executive has stopped working? This executive prevents those people from earning a living. It's this executive that now seems to have trouble sending down support to those very people. That's failure to me, surely. <laughs> Sorry. Mr Deputy Chair, that was, a, that was a short point and a political polemic as well, all added into one. I give you latitude as my able deputy to do that, but that's an unfair question for Joanne to answer. Okay. Uh, Jim, you wanted a very sh short one? Well, there's no answer to that. No. <laughs> well, very quickly, I wanted to take you back to casement. Um, we know that the cost of the casement project has gone through the roof, that there are several extra tens of millions required. Is all of that extra commitment coming from the taxpayer, or is the GAA going to increase its modest contribution? That would be a question for the Department of Art for Communities. They are obviously in charge of the casement project. So at, at this point in time, the funding we have provided is, as to the best of my knowledge, within the original amount agreed for Casement Park. Um, anything beyond that, as I say, the, the discussion is ongoing between the department and the GAA or for the Department for Communities to comment on. Okay. You know nothing about that? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not over the detail of that. I, I do know that the funding we have provided to date is within the, the overall limit agreed originally for the project. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Joanne, just, uh, just one final thing before we let you go, and you'll be thinking quite glad of that and sort of making, giving yourself a very large, sort of hopefully duty free scotch to be able to sort of deal with the, sort of the pressures of this. But let's just to get it right. So the draft budget is 23 billion, 11.5 billion in resource, 1.6 billion in capital, and 0.7 in FTC. Correct? Yes, and there's, there's 1.75 billion total in capital handed out because we have access on borrowing for that. Yeah, so, but we are also expecting, based on what the Minister has said, between NDNA, Confidence and Supply and City Deals, an extra 164 million in resource and 90 million in capital. Yes, and right. we're also expecting to be able to carry over 200 million from COVID monies that we haven't been able to spend because that came in sort of at the at the end of the end of the quarter. So that's an extra four hundred and fifty four million. So that's expect that's expected on top of what we're within the budget. Am I correct in that assessment? So that's an extra half yeah. a billion. 
Yeah, firstly, the 200 million has yet to be confirmed with Treasury, but yes, we're anticipating that. Um, in terms of the NDNA, city deals, etc., yes, it's not reflected, you're completely correct, it's not reflected in the budget figures, but departments would anticipate that they're getting that funding. So, right, so, 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 so the envelope we should be looking at is the 23 billion plus the 454 million. I, I wouldn't include the 300 million in the budget envelope as yet. That will come in in year. So, although we knew we're getting it, I wouldn't add it into the budget envelope. Well, we could pro, we could, we could, we could, yeah, pro, sure, we could, prof right. yeah, but we could, profile, exactly. we could profile that over sort of uh, quarter one and quarter two because if the suggestion is that particularly when we're looking sort of for pay awards for particular health service workers and the people who have been really put themselves on the line from COVID is to be met for in-year monitoring. So there must be an expectation that 454 million will profile over the quarters one and quarter two. Well, I mean, the 200 million, we're, we're anticipating that it will come in in the, in the new financial year. If, we're, if Treasury do confirm, we're expecting that, that we're able to carry that forward. So yes, yeah, so it'll be over the, the, the next financial year, so over 21, 22, and hopefully confirmed at the start of the year. Okay. And where does the 126 million that the minister's talked about that he's keeping for extra COVID resource, where does that fit into all that? Well, that, that is available um, and isn't in the departmental figures in the draft budget, and that's something that the executive will consider as, as they um, undertake their final budget deliberations. So that's can 23 I, billion plus 454 I, yeah. plus 126. Sorry, in the figures there because he think he maybe has them in front of him. Sorry, sorry, just to say that 126 is already included in the draft budget. It's just sitting right, centrally. Okay, it's not so, been allocated okay, to the department. So it's 23 billion plus 454, roughly. Yes, 11, 11 billion of that is annually managed expenditure, which we have limited control yeah, over. Yeah, 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 but sort of just just to, just just using my chief executive's uh, chief financial officer's head, looking at the sort of the sort of the big picture stuff and the rest of it. Okay, listen, you've given us an enormous amount of uh, food for thought, and uh, and I appreciate the length of time you've spent on the conversation, but uh, we know each other well enough now that uh, we can be open and frank in our conversations to be able to do that. Look, there are some issues that have, have arisen that we need to get some answers to, and maybe writing to the TEO and uh, uh, obviously to the finance minister about that as well. Um, the next question is obviously because you know there's a significant amount of differentiation here between what's going to be the draft budget when the budget's due to go through, and bearing in mind the short consultation period of time, one of the things this committee will no doubt be asked to think about is accelerated passage. And bearing sure. in mind that you're not expecting to spend some of the profile money until later on in the year, uh, the question about whether we grant accelerated passage is something we're going to have to take quite a lot of uh, uh, cognizance of as we are kept informed of how this process goes. Because sure. um, I am, to say the least, like, there is a lot of um, loose ends in this that need to be looked at, and we do need to scrutinise this very carefully. And I would also suggest that most of the other committees uh, are going to have to spend quite a sort of lot of time looking over this one with a fine-tooth comb, uh, with the particular the amount of monies that are involved in this as well. So I just wanted you to uh, sort of raise that uh, point with you, so that you're no doubt about sort of particularly where my thinking is at the moment. But we'll discuss it with the rest of the committee as we go through. But I just wanted you to have that one in the back of your uh, thought processes because. You know the chances of us um, rubber stamping this and going through, and looking very closely at my sort of able deputy who sits there, sort of he's uh, he can already see his brains uh, clicking over. Uh, we need to be we we need to be aware of that. So I just wanted to know that as well. But finally, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Sean. Chair, can I just respond to that point? Sorry, on accelerated passage. Yeah. Um, the accelerated passage um, to the budget bill that's going to be introduced in uh, February. The budget bill in February does not actually relate to the budget that's before us today. Oh yeah, yeah, we know. We know. We know, we know, we know. Yeah, it, it, it's a vote on account for 21-22, and it's purely a percentage of the figure that you're voting through. The final figure for 21, sorry, for 2021. The, the vote on account has no relation at all to the draft budget that's been published or to the final budget. The budget bill for that will be um, introduced in May, June time. So it, it's just important to differentiate between those. Um, obviously, you will need time to consult fully on the budget 21-22.
but we would hope that between this draft budget and I final budget in March and then the budget bill relating to that being introduced in May and June, that there would be sufficient time for the committee to consult on that. The budget bill that's been introduced in February, as I say, reflects the final position for 2021, which would be the outcome of the January monitoring round. But the vote and account on that is for 21-22, and that is purely a percentage of the 2021 figure. It is not based in any way on the draft budget that you're considering today. Yeah, but we shall take advisement on that, and we will take advice on that. But I think, I think many of the committees here in the assembly, we want to send a message about making sure we get ample time to scrutinise and examine and look. And if we look over what's happened over the last year through no fault of your own. We can all say it's down to COVID or whatever it happens to be, but we do indeed need to set sort of the process of what we need to do. But I just wanted to sort of lay that one down there so it doesn't come as a particular surprise. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, we're we're uh, happy to come back and, and talk more on that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. 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 Joanne, Jeff, keep yourself safe. And uh, no doubt we'll be spending a lot of time talking to each other over the following yeah. weeks. Okay. Give our best to everybody Bye. back in the building. Okay. Cheers, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, Chair. Chair, thanks very much indeed. Okay, if we can take uh, Joanne and Jeff off Starley. Done that? Yep. Okay. Okay, team. Um, sorry, off Spotlight. Why don't I keep on to calling it Starley as well and the rest of it? Um, team, I think it would be useful if we commissioned uh, Ray's to undertake analysis of the draft budget proposals. I think right. I don't think we've any uh, disappointment with that. Yep. I might want to wish, the, wish to ask the committee to write to the other statutory committees to encourage them to scrutinise the draft budget. I think I learnt a couple of things today that I hadn't picked up on, so I would encourage all the other committees to do that. And if we can do that, uh, Peter, we do that, expedite that to get that through as well if we're in agreement. And the same vein, the Finance Committee may also wish to schedule oral evidence in early February from the Department of Finance for the Finance Divisions to scrutinise their own Department of Budget Allocation. I think we're agreed in that. Uh, might wish just the committee to write to key stakeholders seeking their views on the draft. There's a whole variety of stakeholders, but uh, if anybody's got anybody in particular we would like to invite to become involved. But I would also one of the lists that I've been given. I also like to invite the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce to uh, be involved with that. We've got the CBI, FSB, Hospitality, Ulster, Retail, NI, NICFA, First Division Association, NIPSA. Um, Matthew, do you want Pivotal to respond on it because they've done some issues on it, or um, I'm not for, I mean, uh, I'm not sure Pivotal would. Resp I mean, they've already not? I think they've already a, made the first comment budget about they've budgets here. and process, so I just yeah, wonder why not. We're worth having them. Okay, I'm happy to second that. Gemma, Pauline Balik. Hello. No, you just looked as if you wanted to say something else. No, no, no. I'm just listening intently. <laughs> okay. Cheers. Thanks very much, Judy. I would like you to add the WAVE organisation on the pensions issue. Yes. They have been leading on that. Yeah. Okay. Are we still live? Uh, we are on the airway. Yes. Us. Okay. Okay, if we move on to the next item on the agenda, yes. item number six, oral briefing from Ray's on building regulations. Uh, is Dan there? Can Dan come in on Spotlight? Yes. Hi, Dan. Yeah. Good, Good to see you again. If I haven't said it already, Happy New Thank Year you. to you. Uh, can Thank you, you sort of, uh, we're, the briefing paper on combustible cladding materials at page 29. Dan, can you make your presentation, please? Thanks very much, Adu. Yes, I certainly will. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, so I'm going to summarise for you this briefing paper which seeks to compare the different ways in which England, Scotland and Wales have approached the issue of combustible cladding in high-rise buildings. Members will be able to find uh, a copy of the paper on page 30 of the pack. Now, the first thing I should say is that, as members will no doubt appreciate, this is a highly technical issue and the subject of fire safety is a broad and complex area. Uh, I'm certainly not, nor is anyone in the Research and Information Service, I think it's fair to say, an expert in these subjects. So while I've done my best to examine recent changes in legislation and guidance on combustible cladding, additional input will no doubt be required from the committee for um, uh, from expert witnesses, departmental officials and stakeholders in the field. So this paper seeks to provide a comparative overview of approaches taken to the, the banning of combustible material. Just a little bit of context, first of all, uh, members will be aware, of course, that a number of developments have occurred since the events at Grenfell Tower in June 
2017, in which 72 people tragically lost their lives. The phase one report from the Grenfell Tower inquiry found that the fire started on the fourth floor and rapidly spread throughout the building. The building was constructed of reinforced concrete uh, with an external cladding system comprising insulation boards with aluminium composite material or ACM rain screen panels. The rain screen panels contain a polyethylene core uh, and polyethylene is a highly combustible substance. The material from which most of the insulation boards were made, polyisocyanurate foam, is also combustible. And the inquiry concluded that the main reason for the spread of the fire was the ACM cladding used on the exterior of the building and the insulation boards to which they adhered. Since the events at Grenfell Tower, the UK government and various of the devolved administrations have sought to change building regulations and associated guidance to ban the use of combustible materials in the cladding of high-rise buildings. But they have taken slightly different approaches. In simple terms, England and Wales have banned combustible cladding entirely, while Scotland has taken a different approach. And members may find it useful to refer to page 38 of the pack, on which they'll find a table which uh, simply compares across those jurisdictions. I'll go into a little bit more detail now, and I'll start with England. So following the Hackett review, the UK government introduced a ban on combustible materials for England in December 2018. More precisely, this means that materials which become part of an external wall or what's called a specified attachment must be of either European classification or Euro class A1 or Euro class A2. And if they are, they must be either S1 or D0. And I'll go into what those terms mean in just a moment. The ban applies to buildings over 18 meters above ground level, which contain one or more dwellings, contain an institution, including residential schools, care homes and hospitals, sheltered accommodation and student residences, or which contain a room for residential purposes, but it doesn't include a room in a hostel, hotel or a boarding house. So what do these terms mean? Well, European classification A1 means that it, it simply will not contribute in any stage of the fire, including the fully developed fire. Uh, class A2 means that it will not significantly contribute to the fire load and fire growth in a fully developed fire. Uh, but only S1 and D0 will qualify. The classification S refers to the term smoke. Uh, so S1 means that the cladding will contribute weak or no smoke. S2, which means medium smoke, or S3, if it produces high smoke, are not allowed. D refers to dripping. So D0 means that the cladding will produce no dripping at all when tested. D1, which is slow dripping, or D2, which is high dripping, are also now banned in England. Uh, one other difference which has been made in England relates to the issue of desktop tests, sometimes referred to as assessments in lieu of test. And this is where the results of a test for one set of materials can be transferred across to a slightly different set of materials if an expert judges that to be sufficiently robust. That used to be permissible, but in England this practice has now also been banned except in very limited circumstances. So I'll briefly describe the approach taken in Wales now. Now in Wales, the Building Amendment Wales Regulations 2019 came into force uh, on the 13th of January 2020. And similar to the approach taken in England, these regulations ban the use of combustible materials in cladding systems. The ban applies to the complete wall assembly and certain attachments to the external wall, including balconies and solar panels. All materials which become part of an external wall must be, and this is identical to England, Euro class A2, S1, D0, or class A1. Now the changes to regulation in Wales as I said, are very similar to those introduced in England. There's just one difference evident. In England, what they mean by a specified attachment means a balcony uh, or a solar panel attached to an external wall. In Wales, they've added a device for reducing heat gain. In other words, some kind of a sunshade is also added. Now in Scotland, uh, a somewhat different approach has been taken to the issue of flammable cladding. There is no outright ban on the use of combustible cladding in high-rise buildings. The technical handbook, which was updated in October 2019, states that insulation and cladding materials on the outside of buildings 
should be either non-combustible, that means Euro class A1 or A2, similar to England and Wales, or if the system incorporates combustible materials, the facade system should undergo what's called a BS8414 test. So this means that materials must either be non-combustible in themselves or combustible materials can be used as long as the system as a whole has been tested and shown to be safe using a BS8414 test. So this approach is not the same as the one that's now been adopted in England and Wales, where any components of the cladding or insulation materials must be of a non-flammable type. So what is a BS8414 test? Well, this is designed to provide data to enable evaluation of the fire performance of a complete cladding system, as opposed to the performance of just individual elements. It's designed to test the cladding system, but not necessarily one which perfectly replicates a specific individual building. It does not, therefore, include features such as uh, additional windows, balconies, or other elements which might be there in reality. BS8414 is often referred to in combination with another document, BR135, which sets out the performance criteria for each of the different material types available. So to put it simply, BS8414 uh, specifies how the test should be carried out, and BR135 sets out the performance criteria that must be met if materials are to be regarded as safe. Now, the Scottish Government has stated that assessments in lieu of a BS8414 test should not be used. However, this doesn't mean that assessments in lieu of test are necessarily illegal there. In terms of the legal standing of text supplied in a technical handbook, the Scottish Government states that the handbook provides, and I quote, guidance on achieving the standards set in the Building Scotland Regulations 2004, end of quote. The technical handbook is designed to assist with compliance, but is not in itself a legal text. So desktop tests can still be used in Scotland if an expert verifier states that the results of a particular test are sufficiently robust. Now, I think it's fair to say a range of views have been expressed regarding the approach adopted towards cladding materials in Scotland. The Scottish Government Review Panel on Building Standards Fire Safety recommended in June 2018, and I quote again, that BS8414 and BR135 would remain as an alternative method of providing evidence to show compliance. And they also add that in this manner, innovation would still be possible. By contrast, a report submitted to the Grenfell Inquiry by Professor Torero of University College London stated that, and I quote, tests such as BS8414 provide a single scenario deemed consistent with an external fire, a very limited number of measurements, and a very simple failure criterion. The combination of these three characteristics does not provide a sufficiently comprehensive assessment of performance." End of quote. So finally then, on the 30th of July 2020, the Scottish Government's Technical Working Group published a draft advice note on external wall systems. And it was stated that the government was seeking views on this draft ahead of publishing a final advice note later in 2020. The draft states that the BS8414 test can continue to be used as a means of testing the safety of an external cladding system, even where that system contains materials which do not conform to European classification A1 or A2. And at this point in time, we still don't know the final outcome of that consultation. So thank you, Chair. That concludes uh, my summary of this paper. I'd be happy to take any questions that the committee might have. But as I said earlier, given the highly technical nature of the subject matter, I may not be able to provide answers in every case. Okay, Dan, thanks very much today. Jim? Um, <clears throat> you mightn't have come across this in your research, but uh, this is a very complex and difficult issue, with, and if it goes wrong, has sort of horrendous results. Why are we doing it what would happen if we just simply had a policy in Northern Ireland? We just did not allow cladding of any type on a building. Uh, in your research, did that indicate would it have any detrimental effect uh, in this part of the UK? Because We've had conflicting arguments from all sides as to what's, what's safe what, and which isn't, and what type of tests are acceptable and which are not, and you've outlined very clearly uh, some of the complexities of that. But given the fact that very few of our buildings have this type of cladding anyhow, what would be wrong in simply saying, for clarity and safety, we just don't have any cladding? Well, that's probably something that departmental officials will be 
would be better answering. But I mean, the, the arguments in favour of, uh, of of safe cladding uh, put forward are often things like it, it, it does uh, reduce water penetration. Um, cladding can uh, improve insulation. There are clearly properties which have which have led um, uh, developers to use cladding. Um, but really, that's that, that's probably a, 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 a policy decision that probably departmental officials would be better advising on. Yeah, except I just thought that you might have seen something as you were doing your research, uh, which would have uh, helped expand on that argument. But well, thank you, anyhow. Yeah, Dan. Just so I mean, in your research, and thank you very much indeed. And I know sometimes you're asked to research things within RAISE, and it seems to be quite a broad remit. And this one's a very particularly technical in nature. But in anywhere in your search of the literature and the rest of it, it's very obvious that in England and Wales they've decided they're banning the use of combustible materials and cladding systems full stop because they do not believe that the risk is acceptable. I'm not seeing that from Scotland, but because it's an ongoing discussion in Scotland, you can see that potentially there's a direction of travel going there. Yet we are being invited, in some respects, to follow the classifications and the standards of the material, which would say that it is non-combustible, but we are not making a recommendation of not putting in non-combustible materials. Is there any reason why we are – this is the thing that has puzzled me all the way through – why we are taking a separate route to England and Wales, who obviously use much more of this stuff and build many more buildings than we do? Have you seen anything in the literature? that refers to why we'd be taking a particular separatist route? I haven't, I'm afraid, Chair. No, I haven't. Again, I think probably departmental officials will be best um, describing in detail why this particular recommendation has been made for Northern Ireland. Uh, but that's not something I've come across in the literature, no. I know, Dan, it's not a fair question, but um, put it this way, if it was me and I was building a, a, with the evidence I have in front of me now, and if I was building a new property, I would make very sure I was using the English, English and Welsh rules and not the, the others. Um, again, is there any indication from uh, any of the sort of the material you've looked at at all? Have there any been any concerns raised apart from the manufacturers of this about implications of going for non-combustible material in Northern Ireland? I think it, I mean I think it's fair to say, and, and the Scottish Parliament um, uh, Local Government and Communities Committee have been looking into this issue for uh, almost three years now, um, and you will sometimes see the argument given that um, that being able to incorporate uh, um, uh, materials which are not strictly non-combustible but can be shown to be non-combustible as part of a system allows for um, innovation. Um, and allows for new and innovative uh, materials to be used. That argument sometimes seems to be made, um, uh, could probably be you know, better made by, by those who have advocated it, and the Scottish Government, um, their review panel certainly made that argument that innovation is, is something um, technologically that should still be allowed by, by the, the overall system. Um, but that seems to be, I think, the, the one argument for sometimes incorporating materials which don't necessarily conform to A1 or A2. Okay, thanks, Dan. Dan, thank you very much indeed. Um, team, have we had other questions? Oh, sorry. Philip? Philip? I was going to ask Assembly Broadcasting to add Philip McGuigan back to the spotlight. Thank you. Go ahead, Philip. Thank Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Dan. Dan and this is probably our fault, Dan, in terms of uh, asking for, for for the research. But I mean, I, I think it would have been useful to have given us a fuller picture, maybe to have some comparison with the South as well, just given the, the crossover A of the construction firms uh, and the manufacturer across this island and B, the prevalence of people and, and builders north travelling south and, and vice versa. So, I mean, I, I know it isn't included in your research, but perhaps you, you would have some knowledge of just exactly where the South sits with regard to these regulations. Yeah, um, I am aware that they appointed a fire, fire safety task force, uh, which reported, I think, in uh, yeah August 2018. I mean, I'd be very happy to go away and have a look at that and, and report back to the, the committee. Um, as I recall, the focus of that task force, I think, was really on the condition of current buildings um, and the extent to which the, the cladding may need to be inspected, tested further, and some kind of redress put in place. 
I'm not aware that changes have been made to building regulations, um, but I'm happy to go away and check that and come back. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, I through the, you, the chair. I mean, I think that might be worth just having a wee addendum to the paper that Dan has already produced. Uh, yeah, Philip, I'm I'm more than happy to do that. I, memory serves me correct. There was an issue in Dublin with some buildings that had to be condemned due to cladding issues and fire safety issues. And I think there were parallels with potential discussions about what was going on with Grenfell as well. So I think with the committee's approval, looking around, I think we've got it. Uh, yes, if we could ask you to do a bit of further research to look at how sort of the building regulations. And I think just to point you in the right direction, Dublin City Council were doing some particular work with the uh, health and safety ex executive uh, in the south as well. So maybe that would be a good place to start if you were content with that, Philip. OK, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just want to remind members that we've got uh, Bill Control Northern Ireland to brief the committee in early February. Thank you. If we can take Dan from Spotlight, if we've achieved that. Uh, next uh, item on the agenda is a raised brief on Freeport. Uh, inform members that the following papers are relevant to the agenda item raised paper Freeport's Northern Ireland Protocol on page 43. And members, are we content to note the paper for now and reschedule their oral briefing for a later date? Uh, just on that, one of the things that we have asked is some further information on what is meant by um, oh, the name is escaping me at the moment. It must be a senior moment. State aid, uh, state aid and particular on state aid rules, and I think that might be How germane. Did you know that? Because we were talking about it earlier <laughs> on. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about it earlier on. So everything's pre-proofed in this one. Uh, so that you know, I think one of the things that come out in the dis discussions in free ports is what's defined by uh, state aid rules and how state aid rules are likely to move on to it. Thank you. Move on to uh, agenda number item eight: uh, the oral briefing from Solus, uh, NI, and Nelga uh, on EU successor funding in Northern Ireland. I can ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring on Martin, John and Lisa to Spotlight, please. Let me know when we're up and running. Uh, Martin, is that you? I'm here. Good afternoon. Can you, can you hear me, Chair? Uh, just about. OK, let's give it that one. Uh, Martin. Sorry, poor video. Oh, uh, dear. Anybody else here? Uh, Martin, can, is there any way you can turn the volume up? I apologise. We have been having a terrible day with uh, IT here today. Okay, any better? Uh, any better? Uh, slightly better. We'll, we'll try and persevere. Lisa, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Lisa. At least that bit works. John, are you there? Yes, I am indeed. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, just to inform the members, Councillor Martin Kearney, is the Nilga Vice President and Member for Mid Ulster District Council. John Tully is Solus NI and Director of City and Organisational Strategy at Belfast City Council. And Lisa Cain is Head of Performance and Partnerships at Nilga. Uh, I just want to inform you that the following papers are relevant for this agenda item. Clark's note on EU funding on page 68. Uh, the Ecosyn paper on EU successor funding in Northern Ireland, the position paper for Solus NI, is at page 71. Martin, could you uh, speak first, and then can I ask John to come in afterwards? Thanks very much, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Uh, I am Martin Kearney, Vice President of Milga, the Northern Ireland Local Government Association, which is representative body for councils, and uh, as you said, I'm also a member of Mid Ulster District Council. Firstly, can I thank you for the invitation to address your committee today? You've had a very busy day on the important matter of the replacement of EU funding. Uh, Nilga and Solis are firm partners, and we have jointly developed our submission paper as shared with the committee. You will have seen in the paper that councils have benefited significantly from EU funding. And if I may just divert for a moment to indicate and give you a few lines from my own council. Um, uh, if we consider the EU funding programme for 2016 to 2022, Mid Ulster managed an RD. P programme amounting to £10 million, pounds, an ERDF programme of £1 million, a peace programme of £3.36 million, connecting Pomeroy, which was a standalone £1 million programme, and ESF funding 
program of 7.9 million. We catered for rural development, business growth and jobs, special support for SMEs, social inclusion, research and innovation and good governance. Members, that was a total uh, investment of a staggering £27.36 million. Pounds. So, the RD programme, which, which I was personally involved with, comprised local councillors and social partners, all with experience and expertise in diverse aspects of rural development, and local, del local delivery using local knowledge with robust monitoring and accountability. Members, the placement of this funding is vital, particularly in the context of economic recovery and the joint paper sets out recommendations and principles for a new approach that moves away from the structural funding approach. Since 2015, the role and remit of councils has changed considerably. We are now responsible for local development planning and community planning functions and we are leading the development and delivery of city and growth deals in Northern Ireland. I am associated with the MSW Growth Deal. Our strategic role as a local level must be taken into account when uh, de deciding and uh, deciding on projects which will be delivered under the shared prosperity. Um, so, the Central Local Government Partnership Panel met earlier today and heard a call from all tiers of government, the private sector, and the third sector to work together to ensure co-design of how the shared prosperity fund will be operated in Northern Ireland. At a meeting of the EU Transition Force earlier this month, the Minister Robert Jenrick announced the establishment of a UK task force involving the four LDAs. This morning we asked the partnership panel to establish a similar group in Northern Ireland. So by working together we can achieve better outcomes maximize the impact of funding, and ensure that we are all equipped to deal with the challenges ahead. Finally, members, I note that the uh, uh, shared prosperity fund should be designed to unlock the potential and improve the connectivity and accessibility of Northern Ireland's rural areas, support rural businesses, and close the gap between the income levels in rural and urban areas. Chair, if I may now, I will hand over to the Solace representative, John Tully, but I would add that my Nilga colleague, Lisa O'Kean, is available on the line to take some questions later as well. Thank you, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, yes please, John. Okay, thank you, Chair, and just to, to echo Martin's thanks for the invitation to address the committee today on the Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, I'd just like to start by outlining the importance of the current funding. Um, you know, the, if you look at the current program period between 2014 and 2020, the e ERDF and the ESF funding has amounted to over 492 million euros across Northern Ireland. And those funds have helped to target the areas or the issues of greatest need. And it's helped to address market failure and structural economic disparity across Northern Ireland. So there'll be some significant achievements with that funding including uh, 900 more Northern Ireland businesses are now engaged in R&D. There's been a 75% increase in the number of high growth SMEs, and there's over four, uh, over 46,000 participants have been supported through the access to employment interventions, and over 30,000 apprentice MI participants have received the ESF uh, funding support. And just to, to give a, a Bel Belfast City Council perspective, Belfast City Council through its local economic development unit has supported ESF organisations by providing advice and support and much funding for specific projects. And some of the projects that we have supported have provided vocational training for people to enter the labour market. Um, the Belfast Boats project has targeted those furthest from the job market. Um, it's, there have been projects to help people with disabilities or health conditions to gain employment, and there have been projects to support people with learning difficulties and autism to get into jobs for the future. So Belfast City Council has seen firsthand the transformative work that's carried out by the organisations that deliver these projects into local communities, uh, providing employment and skills for those in economic hardship and those who are removed from the labour market. Um, so whilst those are really fantastic achievements, um, 
there are limitations with the current model, um, and those would include the, the role of councils, which is, um, in terms of designing the programme, it's very much about, as a council team rather than a real partner and place shipper. Um, the current EU programmes tend to focus on the delivery and the outputs rather than focusing on outcomes and addressing local issues. And the time scales for assessment and approval of the projects is problematic for, app for applicants in Northern Ireland and can face significant delays when compared to other European jurisdictions. Um, so turning attention to the successor funding, um, the scale of the EU successor funding is of critical importance to drive the increased productivity and address economic inactivity. And the budget allocation needs to match or exceed the current funding level. Um, the current funding allocations for Northern Ireland should be ring-fenced and there should be no future uh, cuts or diversions of fundings to other initiatives. And the, it's really important that the Shared Prosperity Fund must not be used to replace reducing budgets within government departments. So you will see from the, the, the SOLAS paper that um, the, as well as uh, ensuring that the scale of the successor funding is, is at least the same as existing, that the way in which it's operated is also critically important. And the report outlines some suggested principles for the fund which to summarize is firstly that there is a, a national framework that sets a high level of strategic direction and priorities. And alongside that, there's the ability for, to set regional and sub-regional priorities so that funds can be targeted to local needs. And we believe that this is best done through a collaborative approach. Partners that include councils, Best NI, education, health, and the voluntary sector alongside industry. Um, the principles also state that this should be predefined and measurable outcomes and impacts from the successor funds, uh, which demonstrate meaningful progress, for example, towards uh, progress towards um, employment. Um, and funding should also be via a flexible pot that's based on identified need, taking a strategic approach and looking across all the funding sources. And the approach to the flexible pot needs to minimise bureaucracy and take a balanced approach to the scrutiny and oversight. Um, and also the management and delivery should be devolved where possible. Um, I think the 11 councils have demonstrated their ability to convene partners through the COVID recovery work that has been done, through the community partnerships and the city and growth deals, as Martin has outlined, and to work in partnership and develop those local priorities and drive that sustainable economic growth. So there's a strong track record of doing that work. Um, the principles also talk about balancing the risk appetite with the opportunity for deliberation and the processes for management and appraisal being proportionate to the level of funding and not being overly bureaucratic. So Chair, that's a quick summary of the principles. Uh, and it's just important to note that they should be applied collectively so that we achieve the best outcome from the successor funding. Uh, in terms of the priorities for Shared Prospective Fund, um, the recent analysis from University of Ulster's Economic Policy Centre on the impacts, uh, potential impacts from COVID-19, which suggests that productivity is down between 25 and 30 percent. GDP reduced by 8.1 percent, um, that the economy will contract between 7 and 10 percent, and that over 200,000 jobs would be impacted. So it's important that the Shared Prosperity Fund is defined in the context of that recovery from the COVID pandemic, and is also flexible enough to adapt to new challenges which might arise locally. So with that in mind, the key areas that we believe that the uh, fund should focus on are on skills and employability, particularly within that current economic context in terms of reskilling, upskilling, and tackling long-term economic inactivity. Um, secondly, then on business growth, looking at business resilience, rebuilding businesses, um, supporting all stages of business growth pipeline and boosting those sectors that have future growth prospects. Um, it also needs to look at innovation, looking at locally-led innovation, digitization of businesses and growing much more innovative businesses. Uh, it also needs to look at places in terms of leveling up and those local partnerships 
that can take a place-based approach to community planning partnerships in particular. And it also needs to look at infrastructure in terms of how the uh, fund can complement the city and growth deals and the investments in digital transport, hospitality, and in tourism. So to summarize on that, um, the Shared Prosperity Fund provides a real opportunity to move away from the limitations of the EU funding and to target people most of need through the programs that uh, address needs at that local level. So the funding, the scale of the funding needs to be at a minimum match the EU funding provision and the way in which it is, is operated um, needs to be based around those principles that we're suggesting. And finally, that councils have a really important role to play in the co-design uh, of the um, projects for the fund alongside other partners like Invest in I, education, health, and the voluntary sector and industry. So thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Lisa, do you want to come in? No, I'm happy enough to proceed. <laughs> okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, just a couple of questions before we get started. Uh, one of the things I was, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things I was struck with by just looking at the paper is the seemingly imbalance of where the funds have ended up. Now, understandably, Belfast gets a lion's share, but Midden East Antrim seems to do quite well. But in the West, and particularly in Londonderry, um, it's sort of like 3% in some areas. Is this because people are not bidding for the getting part of the bidding process, or what, what, what's the reason behind this? Because there seems to be a a large degree of imbalance because understanding where we need to put the structural funds to support sort of development in areas that um, need more infrastructure, need more support for R and D, need more support for sort of business development. It seems to be slightly skewed. Do you have any proposals to be able to sort of to deal with that? And is that something that sort of Nilga is actively looking at? Uh, I suppose that the majority of the funding is based on rural needs, uh, Chair, and uh, that might be a, a quick answer as to why maybe the rural area gets some preference. But um, uh, in our case, we, we were awarded £11 million pounds for, the, for that rural development fund itself, and we spent every penny of it, and it went to all those uh, targets that, that John has spoken about, all those needs, all those um, local government priorities. But um, Certainly, uh, I suppose my first preference was to look after our own, and uh, I can't speak really in relation to the Derry City situation. Yeah. Can I just add to, to, add to that, Chair, if I could? Um, you know, certainly, there, there is a high proportion of funded projects that, that do um, come to Belfast City Council. Um, but I would just stress that there are large companies there that have their headquarters that, you know, that are based in Belfast, and obviously they would be in receipt of the um, R and D grant, for example. All right. But those, those are organisations that would provide a regional service. Um, so both within the EDRF and the ESF funding, you know, would be heavily skewed towards um, businesses that you know that are um, you know providing a service. Uh, from Belfast, but, but they have delivery across Northern Ireland. I was just thinking by looking at sort of by council district, Londonderry in particular has relatively low figures, and of of course sort of the best sort of council district everywhere in Northern Ireland, which is Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council. <laughs> Had to put that dig in, of course I would. Where is that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that was a particularly low level. That was a particularly low level as well. So I'm, I just wonder if uh, Nelga are considering. Sort of evening up or balancing across in a more uh, equitable way, or is it solely based on sort of project management and looking at sort of deliverable projects? I can maybe just add there that um, the criteria that the government department set for for allocating the the funding for local economic development is usually based on, on business population and, G and GDP figures. Um, so that, that's how the allocations are made. And then for the rural development program, it's based on the agricultural land, the number of farming businesses. Um, I should also say that um, the not the totality of funding comes from the EU to councils, and a lot of it is, is dispersed by the government departments themselves, particularly for the large interreg, or sorry, the large um, housing and infrastructure 
projects, um, they would be done centrally. So just depending on population basis of where they are would depend on, on the amount of money being allocated to council areas. I suppose for us, the most important thing is that the, the need is the basis for allocating money, money rather than um, any other criteria, which, and it should be local needs that are driven from community planning groups right up through, through councils and through the assembly. Yeah. Uh, I might also add, Chair, that very often the, the funds are topped up by councils themselves uh, in relation to the, the ESF. Our council um, contributed 271000 alone towards uh, uh, employment-related programmes in Workspace South West College. Uh, so so what the councils top up those. That's why I talk about the figure of $27.36 million, because it allows us to match fund quite often the funding we receive, and, and that's where uh, the co-design and... Uh, the rural idea and working together is a really good idea. Okay, thanks very, thanks very much indeed. Jim? No, I'm happy. Oh, Jim. Other Jim. Other Jim. Yeah, Jim. Just a couple of questions. Um, one of the problems with EU funding always was the daunting level of bureaucracy that attached to it. Do you see opportunities under the Shared Prosperity Fund to trim that and to do things more efficiently? Yes, Jim, uh, you, you, you're, you're on the money, and you're absolutely right, because now that we've all been given powers of local development plans, community plans, and the city and growth plans, uh, the administration of this funding uh, should be developed by the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly in conjunction with councils. This can be best achieved by, as we mentioned earlier, by the partnership panel which met this morning, the body that brings together central and local government. So local government has close links and sense of issues between and within our local communities. As you said, in the past we were consultees in drawing up programmes, but now we have the ability to be partners and place shapers themselves. Yeah, and just to add to that as well, I think that there is a real opportunity in terms of um, the speed of the application process and um, optimising that. Um, they also looking at the level of oversight throughout the project and, and focusing on the right things in terms of progress towards meaningful outcomes and addressing key issues. So I do think there's a real opportunity there to, um, to put something that is proportionate to the level of risk and the level of uh, investment. And of course, under the Shared Prosperity Fund, there's no reason, is there, why a council could not continue to manage a fund or deliver a fund allocation? No, at the moment there is no reason why the council couldn't do that. Um, we heard this morning in the partnership panel that um, the Minister for Finance would be not very confident at this moment that there's going to be an allocation or, or a design possibility for the councils and the departments to work together to prescribe how the funding would be spent in Northern Ireland. That We are currently thinking that we'll have to liaise with Whitehall and MHCLG to do that, rather than it come to the department and then the, the two-way discussion between the department and the, and the councils. Yes, but would you not be getting your allocations directly from the Shared Prosperity Fund? Is there any need for the middleman of the department? I suppose um, if we're trying to both central and local government, we're both trying to deliver on the programme for government, it's best that we, we know what is needed regionally and locally here and the two tiers of government can work closely together. However, I would say that there's no reason why the government department in England couldn't contract directly with um, councils, but I think in terms of good governance, it's best that the two tiers of government in Northern Ireland work together. Yes, but we don't want to replace the EU bureaucracy with extra tiers of bureaucracy here, do we? No, no I, I, I think that the funds should be simple to manage, Mm. Uh, designed with minimal bureaucracy, uh, clear timetables indicated, and speedier outcomes. Jim, that would be our wish. Yes, in the end of 200 page application forms, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chair, I have one other question for Nilga, but it's yep. nothing to do with this subject, so I'll leave it if we have time at the end. Is it a good one? No, it's, uh, I just want some information. Okay, Matthew, and then I'll bring you back at that if uh, do that as well. Matthew, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Could I just get because I'm not sure we got it at the beginning there, or I may have missed it. Could I just get a 
figure on loss, what we where we are in terms of ER um, uh, with ERDF and ESF <laughs> funding that is uh, that needs to be replaced. Ideally, I know you because Northern Ireland obviously wasn't in the MFF up until 2027, but um, what would it have been? Do you have a rough sense of what it would have been? I, I, I think, I think uh, Matthew, you're referring perhaps to the recent press release that there is a there is a, a regrettable that there's a loss of EU structural funds in Northern Ireland in 21, 22. Uh, uh, the figure of 45 to 69 million has been talked about. Uh, we understand this will mainly affect spend within the Department for the Economy and Invest NI. Uh, that's the figure you're referring to, and this therefore will have implications for Northern Ireland PLC itself and the wider economy. But at this point, we have been given no indication that there will be an impact on council projects. We expect that all of the council-managed local development plan projects will continue to run next year and up to December 2022 as they are funded from the existing ERDF programme itself. For example, one of the flagship programmes, Go For It, with a joint programme across all 11 councils, has already secured funding for the next two years via ERDF. Did you hear that? Sort of. Um, oh yeah, we, we, thanks, Martin. Did you? But there no, there's no guarantee about the level of. There is. There's very little guarantee about the level of the SPF beyond that. It's not. They haven't guaranteed to match what the ERDF or the ESF would have been. <coughs> Can I maybe? Can I maybe come in on that? Um, the the current uh, the UK government has said that from 2022 onwards there'd be um, approximately 1.5 billion for the shared prosperity fund for, per year. We would sort of question what how they got to that figure because if it includes ERDF, ESF, the leader element of the rural of the agriculture fund, and the youth employment initiative. We and other LGAs would contest that the actual figure should be 2.36 billion per year. So your view is that the current position of the UK government is that they will be providing less funding than you would have received under. Okay. Um, fine and. Um, Specifically on the question that was just raised about. Sorry, any, excuse me, second, Matthew. Did you get that? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I didn't get all of that. Martin, so it might be if we maybe follow up with a, if we can follow up with a couple of written bits of correspondence yes, afterwards. But, um, but just whoever, whether it's Martin or Lisa or John, and on maybe Lisa actually because she answered about MHCLG before. MHCLG um, is the current lead department on the Shared Prosperity Fund, but it obviously has no. At the minute, it has no virus in Northern Ireland. No, it doesn't, and it is currently the lead. Um, we're invited as part of an LGA task force on Brexit and then trip transition issues to meet with the minister. Um, at the moment, it's, it's every month, uh, and we've been invited further on to a task force to um, look at the rollout of the Shared, Develop Shared Prosperity Fund across the UK. Um, we're waiting for further details on that, and I understand that territorial offices will also be invited. We're not at this point sure what the role of the departments will be, which is worrying. Yeah, but at the minute it's a department, which is MHCLG, which is not, it's not, it's a UK government department, but it's in effect an England only department because all of the, it covers matters which are, all of the matters it covers, i.e. housing, local government, are devolved to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Okay. Fine. Okay, That's very much. That's very much for coming in. Hello, Martin. Uh, went back to our own council days. I spoke to Pat last night. He told me to ask you a couple of hard questions. Pat's Pat McGlone, so give you a bit of a tough time out. Listen, I was wondering if there is uh, the complete impact of the loss of EU funding uh, streams. How do you think this will affect our councils? Well. As, as uh, John has already alluded to... I was going to ask John that, Martin. I was going to ask that to John. I have a wee question for yourself afterwards. I was looking John to answer that one for me, Martin. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Pat. 
Yeah, and certainly, if, if, if we're seeing, uh, I suppose, just to stress again that um, the it's not clear at this stage what the the impact of any funding cuts would be for each individual council at this stage, but certainly um, the successor fund needs to be at least the same amount as what um, the, the current funding pr provision is. Um, you know, again, I would go back to those organisations on the ground that are delivering the, the projects, and you know, we've seen firsthand the work that, that they've done, and we have match funded the, the, the projects that that, um, that they've been involved in. So we would expect it to see a, a significant impact on programmes on the ground, you know, in terms of economic development and employability, for example, in terms of uh, those organisations' ability to deliver. And I suppose when you put that against the backdrop of COVID and the recovery work that's ongoing there as well, um, we would expect to see a significant uh, impact on the ground in terms of um, communities' ability to recover. Uh, thanks. And just another short one for Martin. Martin, just as a councillor, very active councillor there in Mid Ulster and been out and about, do you think that there is still that desire for the schemes to come forward, be they small or be they large, or be they in partnership with councils amalgamating together? But are you still seeing that 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 surge, if you like, of projects within tourism and within small local businesses start up? Are you getting that same turnaround? Yes, I'm, I, I, in, I'm, I'm really, really back, talking about in COVID. If I could just come back. The, the one thing that that we didn't benefit from in the last round. Hospitality and tourism couldn't be facilitated in the last round. So we're really hoping that in the co-design of this, that we can help uh, hospitality and uh, and uh, tourism because they've suffered so much in the last, particularly in the last year. So we found that when we were designing our structure that quite often we were limited in how we could help people. And this allows us the opportunity, as I've said before, uh, I mean, in councils now, uh, five years after we've come together, we've now got the ability to plan, as I've mentioned, that local development planning, uh, community planning, which is the hub of everything. So, in fact, in any planning that we take forward in establishing any priorities, the first thing we look to is the community plan. As I've often referred to it, it's what I call the People's Manifesto, and that's the starting point for everything. But and did you find, we, we Martin... We've great favour with our, with our rural people. And did you find, Martin, through the chair, that there was much work come out of that uh, the engagement with the community through the building up of each council's community plan? Well, I, as you very well know, Mid Ulster is the most entrepreneurial area in Northern Ireland. We have the most uh, VAT registered. We have 9,000 VAT registered businesses. Most of those are small start-ups, and we have been able to help through the lag funding quite a lot of those small indigenous businesses get started. Quite often, starting in garages then moving to the Enterprise Centre, and now, and even just this week, we, we have been talking to Invest NI that there's no land in Mid Ulster where we can develop from after the stage of Enterprise. So the main thing is being able to help all those small businesses, uh, those small communities, those rural communities where, where broadband, and I'm only mentioning it now for the first time, is still one of the major issues. So those are all the issues we have to bounce in the air, but the good thing about European funding was it gave us a start I'd give it a level to begin on and to build on, and now we look to the next level. And you know, Chair, just on the back of that, and we in the Finance Committee should be, and I've spoke of it before, of the great potential we have within Northern Ireland to build up our tourism uh, product. And as we come out of this COVID and what lies ahead, I mean, any money invested in that will be money well spent. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Uh, just finally, Chair, and I, I know probably we're well into your time now, but I, I think that the, 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 any monies that, that we, we disperse in future, they must take account also of recovery from COVID. I think one of the members has already alluded to that, as well as the many new challenges. So it, it gives us a real opportunity now to refocus. Uh, community plans are now being assessed again for the first time. So there's a real opportunity now to have a refocus and to put effort, uh, all our efforts into design and delivery and measurement of of the time ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Jim, you wanted to come in with that? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask to NOGA. NOGA, did NOGA as an organisation receive any COVID grants? 
No, we didn't. Because it's come to my attention that na the National Association of Councillors, strangely, received the £10,000 grant. Nilga did not. No. Thank you. Okay. If I, if I could just add, uh, Jim, how are you? Uh, if I could just add that since the month of March, the officers of Nilga, the office there, have met every Tuesday morning, and that now is between 40 and 50. But every Tuesday morning we've met uh, to deal with the, the outcome of the pandemic and, uh, of course, with many issues within councils. So, in fact, uh, th there's no organisation that's busier with limited staff than the Nilga officers and, and Lisa's here today. So, really, uh, we've, we've had a new lease of life within Nilga. Uh, unfortunately, we've had to respond to what, what our need is. But we meet every Tuesday morning for an hour, uh, the office bearers from each party. And uh, it's been very fruitful, and I think it's put us in a good place to be able to come here today to ask for your consideration. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Sir Martin, apologise for the bad communications link, but John and Lisa, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for your time. If we have any uh, follow-up questions, uh, do you mind if we write to you? Uh, because I know there were some issues I think maybe Matthew wanted just to get some more clarity with. Uh, would you be happy to respond to those? Yes, absolutely, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, team, if we move on now to, uh, if we take. What are you going to write about? Sorry, again. Oh, sorry, Matthew had a few. Uh, some of the questions you wanted to get some answers to. Uh, I believe the question I was asking was about um, uh, funding, and uh, I think the two specific questions I asked from memory were: um, What is their? Do they have a projected funding loss? Those Lisa O'Kean slightly answered it. It would be helpful to get an on the record answer. Do they have a, a number in terms of funding loss, um, and. Um, uh, and if they had had, I think the, then I, I think specifically I asked about what they would have expected to have received. But I think this is a stupid question, but it's, it's the question I asked. So I'm telling it to you now for the purposes of the record. Between 21 to 27, which would have been the seven-year EU yeah, um, horizon period. Okay. Lovely. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you. We move on to item number nine on the agenda: uh, SL1 rates, coronavirus emergency relief number two amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Following papers are relevant to this agenda item, uh, Peter's note on page 117 and the SL1 at page 120, uh, inform you that the Department proposes to make an urgent statutory rule under powers conferred by Article 31C of the Rates Northern Ireland Order 1977. The pros proposed rule will allow the Department to reduce rates in respect of specific hereditaments, properties of which there is a liability to pay rates, which have an industrial distinguishment. The idea of the proposed rule is to allow manufacturing premises to avail of the 12 months rate holiday for 2021. I inform members that the proposed rule will come into operation as soon as possible. That was necess will necessitate a breach of the 21 day convention. The rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedure. Are we content to proceed? Yes. Members are content that the committee has considered the Department for Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the rate. Coronavirus Emergency Relief No. 2 Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation as content for the Department to make this rule. Are we all agreed? Agreed. If we move on to the next item of the agenda, SL1, the Rates Coronavirus Making of District Rates Regulation Northern Ireland 2021. The following papers are relevant. Clark's note at page 124, SL1 at page 125. Inform the members that the Department proposed to make an urgent statutory rule under powers conferred by Article 8 of the Rates Northern Ireland Order in 1977. This requires district councils to set district rates for the following year. The rule will extend the deadline for setting rates from the 15th of February to the 1st of March, and is reported as being made in response to requests from district councils. The Department advises that related parallel legislation is to be made by the Department for Communities. The rule is subject to negative re resolution and assembly procedure, and it is likely to be led in breach of the 21-day rule. Are we content to continue? Content. The members have considered the Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the Rates Coronavirus Making of District Rates Regulations Northern Ireland 21, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation 
and is content for the department to make the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, SL1, the Superannuation Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse Order, Northern Ireland 2021. The following papers are relevant to this agenda item, page 129, page 130. And this is to deal with the pension for the Commissioner, isn't it, yes. Peter? That's it. That the Department proposes to make a statutory rule under the powers conferred by the Superannuation Northern Ireland Order 1972. The rule will make pension provision under the principal civil service pension scheme, service scheme, Northern Ireland, i.e. the Alpha Scheme, for the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse. The proposed rule is to come into effect in February 2021, but it appears that the Department intends to apply the provisions retrospectively from the 2nd of November 2020. It is understood that the Commissioner's term of employment commenced from the 14th of December 2020 for a five-year term. Inform members that the rule is subject to negative resolution and assembly procedure. Are we content to proceed? Okay. That the committee has considered the Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the Super Superannuation Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse Order in Northern Ireland 2021, and has no objection to the proposed legislation and is content for the Department to make the rule. Is this agreed? Great. Uh, Chairperson's business advise members that I met informally with the Minister on the 18th of January in order to discuss his statement on the 21-22 draft budget. And present were the Minister's SPAD, his private secretary, and the clerk were in attendance. The discussion informed the clerk's revised uh, budget note in tabled items, uh, which you heard me make in the Assembly. I'd also like to advise members in respect of the Speaker's letter and the paper considered at the Chairperson's Liaisons Group on the 19th of January 2021 relating to the management of business at the Assembly during the current phase of the pandemic. There are to be fewer question times and no private members' business and no adjournment debates in plenary. Could I, could I come in here, Mr Chairman? Uh, yes. Uh, have you finished the... No, there's, there's a uh, further yeah, bit, but I'll do it. At the Chairperson's Liaisons Group, it was also suggested that consideration be given to reducing the number and length of briefings to committees and the number of witnesses and increasing the use of Starleaf by committee members. Fully virtual meetings were also suggested where all members and staff use Starleaf. Um, before you come in, Jim, um, I have some real concerns about this. I have real concerns particularly for this committee because we deal with the budget and we have significant areas where we need to be on top of the detail. And I think, as we have heard today, and for those of you over the last couple of days who have been trying to do things by Starleaf, um, we are missing things, and we are not getting the necessary clarity that is necessary. And I think, in some respects, we need to be in a position where we are able to maintain uh, proper committee meetings to be able to ne give the necessary scrutiny to legislation that is coming through. Um, but I am open to suggestions and views from the rest of the committee. Jim, I think you have indicated yeah, first. It is easy for me because I, I live in Banbridge and it is not too far to come up to here any day. But I am conscious that people who live vast distances away, like the leak or Dunloy, and uh, therefore it is more difficult for them. But frankly, the problem with this building is, is the internet is woeful. <laughs> Let us be honest about it. Yeah. And I've just actually, I did a survey from the Commission there said the survey, and I said this place is wonderful apart from the dreadful, awful internet. Yeah. And we've just seen today the limitations of what we face. And the difficulty is, I frankly find it very difficult at times to follow Starleaf. And that's no respect, uh, no criticism of the, of the system or the staff. We are just surrounded by these incredibly thick walls which just do not lend themselves to, to a good internet co connectivity. So what I would say is that of those of us who still would prefer to come to a meeting, I think we should be given that option, because I think we could find ourselves do, do, doing something over the internet and it descending into utter chaos. That's me honest. I, I have sat in, I didn't know the word Zoom meant a year ago, and I spend vast portions of my life on it. And whilst the connect, connectivity from Banbridge is very good, I have to say any, any experience I've had here has been woeful and. You know, we, that's the problem. If we could solve that, then I, I, I'm in for as many Zoom meetings or Starleaf meetings as possible. Paul? Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. So, at the start of this uh, emergency, I, I partaked 
I partook in, in, in Zoom uh, with the Justice Committee, and I kept coming to this committee because uh, I felt the obligation as uh, Deputy Chairperson. Uh, but what struck me very clearly was, whilst it was dead handy, and whilst it cut down travelling time, and whilst I could do it from basically any environment I choose uh, to hook on to with regard to Zoom, when it came to scrutinising legislation, mm. it just did not work. It just could not work, and I would not have been an, at the top of anything uh, or across detail if I was scrutinising legislation on Zoom or Starleaf or any other remote device. Uh, it was okay. It's, 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 it might be okay for presenters to be in Zoom or Starleaf, but the committee as a collegiate needs to be together whenever you're scrutinising legislation. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, and if we're not, we lose something. And if we lose something, we do a disservice to our people and democracy. So it's, to me, it's essential that we can keep as close together as possible safely. And I have had no risk issues or concerns around the procedures and the mechanisms of how we've been able to conduct business so far. Now, there's always going to be risk, but it's how you manage that risk, both as an individual and as a committee. And I think we've done, we've, we have, the two committees I'm on, Finance and Justice, have dealt with that risk management entirely appropriately and safely. And I commend everybody involved because it's not easy. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I think it would be a retrograde step if we all were forced one way or the other, or were, were the default position was we all went on to Zoom. Uh, it, I think it would be a nightmare in communication, but when it comes to scrutinising detail, absolutely no good. And just before I bring Philip in, I think last week to me, where we had two expert witnesses who came in to talk about something that is life and death, it was on fire safety. And I do not feel as if I got more than about a third of what the intent was of what they were trying to say. And on behalf of the committee, I've written to them to apologise for the communications links and the rest of it. But for something that's fundamentally as important as fire safety legislation, I do not feel that we were able to do our role effectively in that particular issue. Philip, sorry. Yeah, yeah Chair, thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> I hear him back there. Have you broken up there, fellow? We can't hear you. We can't hear you. <laughs> well, I mean, I just want to start off by making the point that I'm not at today's committee because I live in Dunloy, and I'm sure the CM for Gemma and for Anna were here because we're trying as best we can to follow the public health guidance that we're asking others to 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 follow so i mean i i don't want to get any an argument with anybody that's there in person at the committee but it was regard to uh, my participation today i heard everything that was said by the witnesses i i heard everything that was said within the chamber and was able to participate uh, as best as possible i was actually able to participate better here because i i, I had a laptop as well as my ipad open uh, so I, I was getting d double the information uh, so i mean I think, I mean, obviously we have to do our job uh, and obviously internet connection plays an important part in that. We're asking others out there within society to stay at home unless absolutely necessary, to work at home when they can. I think uh, MLAs who are setting that guidance need to be shown leadership. So, I, I mean, I also think that we shouldn't be putting others, I'm thinking not only about ourselves as legislators, but, you know, the more we are in Stormont and Parliament buildings, the more we're asking staff to come to Parliament buildings as well. So I actually am going to disagree with everybody that spoke prior to this and say that we should be showing leadership and we should be as best as possible uh, working from home. And as I say, I, I didn't feel any less uh, impacted today by participating through uh, Spotlight or Starleaf. Okay, thanks, Philip. Any other comments? Matt? Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Chair. And Philip, um, I, I did stay at home last week. I wanted to follow the guidance and stay at home. I really found it really difficult. Um, I couldn't hear, as I already said to the witnesses. Uh, there seemed to be a delay in me trying to get back in. But I, have, I hear what you say, and my staff have said the same to me today, that they don't think that it is safe 
or myself going in. I should be showing leadership and we should be staying at home. And there were signs on the way down the uh, ring road saying that no unnecessary journeys. So I made my mind up after coming in today now that, that I'm going to try uh, and stay at home as much as I possibly can. Uh, I do love coming in here. I do agree with what the other members have said. There seems to be a different level of scrutiny and engagement when we're here. But look, I, 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 I myself I'm, I'm, I'm going to try as best as I possibly can to follow the guidelines which we have set in the Chamber. So that's my view on it now. I think, uh, just in brief, I think, uh, I think it's right to say that we should uh, indeed be get, setting an example wherever possible. I think Philip's right about that. I, 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 I think that's um, unarguable. It is also true that there are um, technological challenges that make it harder to do um, some of the things that we want to do remotely and we haven't been as caught up as perhaps other um, uh, assemblies, parliaments, whatever have been in terms of providing technology. Um, I suppose the question I would ask is, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in the situation where I obviously live very close, so it isn't, um, uh, I'm not making as big a journey to come in here, um, albeit I'm not coming in here when I don't have a reason, a good reason to be here, and I think it's incumbent on on us to, you know, if there's a better option, uh, and if it's avoidable, to, to to you know to not be um, to not be clogging up the building. But but the question, is, as I understand the question, you, are you asking the question that we should go whether we should go fully virtual as a committee, or whether we should be all trying to be as virtual as possible where we can? There is uh, there is there, there's a, there is a there is a discussion that's ongoing. And one of the problems we have is that the chairperson's liaison group was very well attended yesterday, and the speaker has given uh, has asked for opinion, and it's being asked amongst members of the committee, and it's also been asked by the business managers of the various uh, parties as well to, to, to reach that point. Sure. On top of that, just not ourselves, we have to think of the staff that have to come in and manage here as well. Yeah. So I think we really should be uh, thinking of their safety, just not of our own or on the IT. So I think we should do the lead and do the right thing and follow the guidelines. It's only for another, hopefully, four, five or six weeks. Much as I would miss you all, but that's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Chair, Chair could, could I make a comment? Yeah. Uh, I've asked we uh, tried out the Starleaf. Uh, I must say, in comparison with actually being here, I found it quite unsatisfactory. Um, I think there is partic uh, there's significant added value in being present, when, uh, particularly when there are witnesses. And um, I don't think this should become prescriptive. I think guidance is exactly that, and it should be left to each member to sensitively and appropriately apply the guidance as um, I'm tempted to say, surely this isn't Jim oh, Alistair. Through the chair, sir. Pa pardon me, Matthew, pardon me Chair. Behave. I'm just mischievously, mischievously pointing out that Jim's talking up the benefits of guidance. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to well, actually, <laughs> uh, on that theme, uh, on that theme, no, listen, not listening, on that theme. <laughs> listening to the Sinn Féin representative. Yeah. Is saying we shouldn't be here. I was almost going to say, yeah, shut down, Stormont. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. Okay. And I'm only joking. Sure, I'm only joking on this one. One of the benefits of Starleaf is you can turn it off. Or turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Judging by the two meetings I've had today, there was an awful lot of people over such a thing. Funny enough, it was about lunchtime. I think. Okay. All right. Look, I'll I'll take the views and we'll sort of canvas to see. Look, I think so, we need Chairman, to be. I think I've been misunderstood. If they can sort out the internet, mm. yeah. I would be happy enough. That's my only issue. I, I see no problem with Zoom or Starleaf, but the internet's woeful, and we have yeah. to accept that. And the, that has come up every year I've been here since 1998, the poor internet, and we still haven't solved it. Did they have internet in 1998? They certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And fax machines. <laughs> <laughs> and your phone. <laughs> OK, look. Um, Thank you for that, and uh, it was good to have a, a, a discussion and a smattering of opinion. I think one of the things I'll do is, in coming at me as the chair, it was also the clerk and the deputy chair, we shall look at sort of the business that is incoming. 
and if it can be held remotely with a degree of um, confidence in the uh, IT systems. I think we should at least be seen to be moving along the lines of uh, trying to achieve as much as we can virtually. But bearing in mind there are important pieces of work we do need to do, and we may need to be present for that as well. But we'll take that on cognizance as we go through. Can we move on to agenda uh, number 13, correspondence? Uh, Mr. Wells' favourite item. Which one? <laughs> uh, so the first one is uh, draw members' attention to correspondence on page 141 and 142 from the Department of Health and the Department of Finance, respected to VAT and PPE. The Department of Finance advises that VAT at 20% is payable in PPE but can be reclaimed in the same way as goods from GB or imports from the EU. The Department of Finance notes that HM Treasury discontinued VAT relief on PPE on 1 November 2020. They made a mistake on it. Are we happy to note? Yeah. Uh, move on to the next item. Draw members' attention to correspondence from the Committee for the Executive Office, page 149, including a response from the Right Honourable Michael Gove, MP. I shall uh, take my own cognizance of that particular comment. Regarding governance of the withdrawal agreement and common frameworks, some information is provided on the joint consultative working group. The rules of procedure have been agreed, but a date for a meeting has yet to be determined. The specialised committee is to include the Northern Ireland Executive and experts who are to be invited as required. The specialist committee is to hold a session on Article 2, Rights of Individuals and the Role of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission. There is also reference to the, pol the, the publication of the Intergovernmental Relations Review and the Development of Dispute Resolution Mechanism for the Devolved Administrations and the UK Government. Um, gentlemen um, and ladies, uh, sort of my commentary on this is, is that we have heard a lot about what the specialist committees and the joint committees are going to do. The working groups have not been set up yet. We understand there is only terms of reference currently out there at the moment that has been raised for the joint committee, but we have not seen those. We have had no information whatsoever on what the arbitration panel is doing and who is supposed to be part of the arbitration panel. Whatever the partnership relationship is and the partnership council, there is a, a raft of detail that we need to be aware of. And indeed, one of the things we have asked. We will walk out. We will walk out here, Mr. Chairman. Oh no, so he's probably going to get himself a cup of coffee. Oh, he's back again. He's back again. <laughs> <laughs> he heard me. Uh, so I think what I would like to do is to uh, write to the committee for the executive office to ask them for a if they could. Uh, Give us a more deep, or ask if we can get a more detailed explanation <coughs> of how the uh, various structures are being set up, who's being part of them, and what their terms of reference are, and how they interrelate to the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Northern Ireland Executive. Uh, just for note of clarification, I have written to the Attorney General separately, trying to get to the bottom of who has primacy of legislation, what is the role of the European Court of Justice. And also to work out sort of the, um, the framework diagram and the wiring diagram between the various committees and how those interrelate to both the, two, the British government, to the EU, and to the Northern Ireland Assembly. But I think that might be useful when it comes for us to try and work out things like uh, how we're going to look at state aid rules and other issues as they come forward. Uh, look, I, anyway. You know, I'm a geek in this stuff, and I've been immersed in this for the last three years, and I've lost track on who's doing what, where, and where. No. But I think that was useful. I, I, if I may, Chair, I, I may agree. I think it's really important that we get clarity on how these governance structures are going to work. Uh, so I agree with that, and I think it's it would be helpful. I mean, it would be helpful if the executive office could give us uh, a, a, some of that. Obviously, as the lead department in terms of engaging with. Um, well, the Joint Committee in general, but also the Cabinet Office, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, I think it's them. I mean, it's a matter for the Executive Office Committee, but that might be something you want to mention there in, the le in your letter back that you want that the Committee could be pressing to you for some of those yeah. details. I think it would also be useful if we um, asked the TEO and to join with us jointly to ask Rays to maybe commission, do some research, or maybe commission um, Professor Katie Hayward and David Finnamore, who seem to be the two people who are over the sort of the detail of the wiring diagram of this, whether they could produce a short report on how the, the structure works. I mean, there's no 
uh, it's, it's just a question for us to try and understand um, sort of the framework that we're dealing with, because quite frankly, I have, I am, I'm getting lost in the wilderness of who's doing what, when, and where. And I think it would be useful for all of us, particularly uh, when we're trying to deal with future things along funding lines and issues with VAT and the rest of it, if we understood that. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. I draw members' attention to the fi Finance Minister's response at page 163 to the Committee of Justice regarding the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. He indicates that a business case has not been finalised in respect to the rebalancing of lower and higher court work and thus the associated financial risk has not been quantified. Jim, do you want to say anything about that? No. Okay. Happy to nope. Uh, Roll and remit of independent financial institutions. Draw members' attention to the response from the Welsh Parliament Finance Committee on page 165, indicating that the Government of Wales uh, contracted with Bangor University and subsequently the Office of Budget Responsibility in respect of financial monitoring of government expenditure. <coughs> That committee has reserved its views on the arrangements with the OBR. Uh, a few comments. Um, I noticed when the Minister was making his comments about the budget, we have still yet to hear about the Fiscal Council and the role of the Fiscal Council, that, uh, bearing in mind the briefing we've had today on the budget and on the $485 million that seems to be uh, being looked as a forward spend but hasn't actually been committed to yet. And I think not having a fiscal council in place at the moment is probably detrimental to the effective and uh, open and transparent running of our budget process. Uh, I just wanted to make that point. Uh, I think I've made that point every time I've met the finance minister, so I'm not quite sure what point there will be of writing to him yet again. But I just want to put that on record that uh, we continue to raise this question, and I do believe that we're well overdue to have the fiscal council in place. But I would like you to note uh, raises information from the Welsh and their, their role in that as well. Yeah, Chair, just on that point, because, yeah, I think there still has to be a debate had as to what a, council, a fiscal council should look like and its operandi. Um, and that's still a very important debate. Had. Yeah. Just because something's in a document, that's maybe well be an, an agreement. It, it, it's what that looks like in practice that's the, the important bit. Uh, so, yeah, fiscal council, what does it look like? And, what should it actually do uh, with regards to remit? So, yeah, I'm there. We need to have that discussion. Uh, the other thing the committee would wish to note, of course, is that the procurement board has sat and is sitting again. And one of the things that we would have thought we would have liked to have had would be, I think we've asked for the terms of reference from the procurement board, which we haven't seen. And it would be useful if we had a briefing on the procurement board uh, fairly soon because if the Procurement Board is dealing with um, some substantial areas of uh, cross-governmental procurement, and we're looking potentially at £200 million worth of RRI uh, being put into the process and looking at other procurement issues as well, I think we should be trying to get some information on the Procurement Board fairly shortly. And I would propose we look to put that in the Forward Work Programme if we are agreed. Agreed. Uh, move on to the next uh, formation function of government miscellaneous provisions bill. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, yesterday. Uh, I'll draw members' attention to the list to the amendments to the bill provided by the Department of Finance on page 167, and remind members that I spoke on behalf of the committee at the further consideration stage yesterday. And the final stage is still scheduled for the 2nd of February. So. Jim, does yeah. that concur what you think? Okay. Members, do we have any comments? Okay. Happy to note. Uh, move on to correspondence from the Committee for the Economy. Uh, seek agreement to note three items of correspondence on page 177 from the Committee for the uh, Economy regarding difficulties applying for the COVID business support scheme, criticising the voucher scheme and highlighting that bars and membership clubs have not been eligible for localised restrictions to support scheme funding. Uh, I for a matter of uh, information, I had a uh, discussion with the uh, Chair of the Economy, uh, uh, committee, Priva and I, to ask the questions about, because I couldn't really get my head round how £95 million was going to be moved uh, from the voucher scheme. And obviously, the Economy Committee have similar concerns. I think we should be keeping a watching brief and being asking the Economy Committee to keep us informed of any detail on the voucher scheme and how it's being accounted for. 
I think it's quite important because it is a significant amount of public monies that we are kept fully abreast of the mechanism that that is being used because uh, much as uh, I enjoyed the briefing from our friends from the Department of Finance today, I'm still not, not that much wiser about how £95 million that needs to be spent in year is being able to be moved to next year's expenditure, even within the uh, envelope of the uh, 200 million, which seems to be ever expanding. They haven't agreed it yet, though, have they? Say again. Have they, they haven't actually agreed that yet. No, they haven't. It's the it's a request from the economy. The economy department wants a straight lift and lay. Yeah, yeah, and we need to get some. Yeah. Sorry, Jim. Um, I want to take up a point that Pat raised at the last meeting, and I think we're going to have to now deal with this. There's still loose ends hanging out there with a the scheme. Now, to be fair, even since last week, I have taken a number of very complex cases to the team, the localised uh, restriction scheme, and I have to say, one by one, they've all been sorted out. So I'm going to be fair to them. Yeah. But we're still left with a couple of issues hanging. What has happened to those who had a rateable value of over fifty thousand pounds, who weren't entitled to anything in April? Now, there was talk that there was something going to be done about that. A lot of a lot of hotels fall into that category. Um, a, a, a lot of Vince's golf clubs is another one. Now, I thought uh, there was a 10,000 grant and there was a 25,000 pound grant paid, 15,000 pounds readable value, over 15,000 up to 50,000. Mm -hmm. But those over 50,000 were left high and high. Secondly, what happened to the proposal that single company directors would get, the would, would get payment? But where's that gone? Now, it was announced with a great degree of <laughs> fanfare that at last that the what the forgotten people would, would get something. And uh, uh, Mr Donaldson writes to me constantly about that, uh, and quite rightly so. And I'm, I'm just wondering, where's that gone to? And finally, where is the £9,000 per business that was alluded to in the Chancellor's recent statement? And I just I think, subject to members' agreement, it might be worth writing to the department at this stage just to tie down those loose ends, because lots of people have been well looked after. But there's still those folk who are left hand dry. I sort of just before you come in, Pat. I think we should write both the Department of Finance and the Department of Economy jointly. So there's overlap there. because there is, there is overlap. Because remember, we were due to get the a copy of the memorandum of understanding between LPS and the Department of Economy, and how the funding, how the transfer of funds, and how payments were to be made. And we don't think we've seen that, but I think. If we are content that we write both to the Department of Finance and the Department of Economy on that particular question, Matthew, yeah. sorry, and then I agree. Well, I agree. I was basically going to say this the same thing. I th and I think, because Jim's right, I think we, sh we should be clear when we write to them about what we're asking, so that we don't give them not to be, um, uh, you know, I'm not imputing their motives, but impugning their motives. Um, but we should ask for a specific table, a table laying out. Um, each business support scheme which has been announced, how much, uh, because this is a, both finance, it's an economy policy question for the Committee of Economy and it's a finance um, committee matter in terms of you know, scrutinising because this has been such a core part of public spending over the past year, basically asking for how much money has been dispersed under each scheme and, um, uh, and, and um, uh, and, and what is what's still alive, and, uh, and 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 when it, you know, each scheme runs out. I think we should ask for it in t specifically in table format, so that we can uh, interrogate it and understand. Do you see what I mean? The difference between it uh, asking for a response means they could give us a, a letter back with lots of nice words and palming off, but I think a, a table would be helpful. Matthew, have you got a suggested framework that you could pass over to us? And I have I couldn't, but, but I think we could just be in table format, listing. Um, uh, yeah, 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 is that okay, Peter? Yeah, Pat. Um, what Jim brought up as well was the fifty-one thousand. Um, the day in the chamber when the announcement was made for the ten point six million for the wet pubs. Mm -hmm. I specifically asked the minister for those pubs which had a rateable valuation of £51,000 or over. Whether or not, I'm not sure, I must just go back and look, but he told me that there was uh, money there and they were going to be paid. I haven't seen anyone. I have to put an interest here because I still have a, a sister that falls into that category of a pub. Mm. 
So I, I didn't, you know, I, I'm not speaking of it for herself, but there are people simply because I was in the pub trade has asked me that, and I'm not aware of anybody yet receiving that. But the minister did tell me that they had made allowances for that and payments would be made. So that was them all covered. That was the wet pubs, the, um, the valuation under 10 and up to 25, isn't that right, Jim? What? They were paid in, in April. That's right, they were paid, but there was none paid to the 51,000, no, I mean, and there was no payment to the wet pubs until the 10.6 million was made available. But like yourself, I have yet to find a business with a real yeah. value over 50,000 pounds who's received a penny. That's my point. Okay. Well, there are a lot of rest. There are a lot of hotels in that as well. Okay. Now we can so, so uh, it's, Ma it's Matthew's table plus where are those three, three funds? Things. Yeah, yes. that's, that's, that's the point. Yeah. 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 To make. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, next uh, pivotal report. Next, uh, the new decade, new approach. One year on there on page 185. Uh, to note, yeah. Uh, composite information requests. To note the committee's composite information requests are no news releases or publications circulated. Forward work programme. Forward work programme on page uh, 200. Uh, seek agreement for the scheduling of a closed session with the Assembly Legal Services for the 3rd of February 2020 in res respect to the accelerated passage of the Budget Bill. Just so we can get briefing on that. I think we're agreed to that. Uh, scheduling for the January monitoring round brief on Wednesday, the 27th of January 21. Subject to executive confirmation on the monitoring round outcome, which is tomorrow, I think we were given the indication that was going to be. Are we content to that. Yeah. Uh, seek agreement for session of oral evidence session for Department of Finance on the implications of the draft budget for the Department on the 10th of February 21. Yes. And is the committee content with the draft forward work programme from January to April? Great. Uh, members, do we have any other additional items of business? Sure. Um, I, I was going to try and bring it up earlier, but I was wondering whenever we switch off, I mean, we'll just keep everybody that's online on, but it, it, I didn't want it to go out just in the open airways. Is that possible, or are we not allowed to do that? No, not really, not within the committee. Okay, I was, just going, I was just asking a little bit, I was just looking for some advice just from fellow members. It was nothing. We could, we could do that after the We could do that after the committee. That's, that's good, that's all that's after, after the committee as well. So, uh, subject to uh, any other changes, next meeting on the 3rd of February at 1400. We will look. I shall confer with the. Uh, I will confer with the deputy chair, and we'll see if we can manage to do it by Starleaf or by uh, remote means, if we are content. Okay. Is there no meeting next week. Sorry, it's a misprint by the clerk. It is, of course, a meeting on the 27th of uh, January. Oh, sorry. sorry. My, my, resign, my, uh, resign. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> delighted to. I was, I was looking for a day off there. I've got an apology in now. Okay, so I'll be at home. Okay. Cheers. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, and thank you very much indeed for, for, for your attendance. Gemma, be safe. Philip, be safe. And, uh, and if you're talking to Melissa before I get a chance to talk to him, please pass on our condolences to him. But we will be writing to him, and I wrote to him yesterday, and I'm very sorry for his loss. Okay. Thanks very much indeed, team. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Uh, I just wanted to ask you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.